This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. A very, very good afternoon to the kids from the Baka Elementary. We are in Juma Game Reserve. I am going to be looking for some of the very much interesting animals this afternoon for you. And my name is Sydney. I am not traveling alone this afternoon. I am with Senzo. He is my camera operator. And kids, for the questions and comments, ask us through your teachers. I am going to be looking for all the interesting animals I can find for you this afternoon. The weather is very much fun. It's nice and cool, which is good for the animals' activities. Without any waste of time, I am going to start looking now. Senzo, let's reverse and take the Weaver Nest Road and see if we can find something interesting for the kids that side. It is very lovely here where I am, but I am not alone. I do have some other colleagues who are at this stage based in Mara. They are showing you some lions. Girls, and I hope you have enjoyed seeing the giraffe with Sydney in South Africa. And will you believe how far now we have brought you? We have brought you to an area north of South Africa called East Africa, and specifically in a country called Kenya and what you got on your screen after having seen the giraffe are lions and I can tell you they're males because I had been with them for some time and how is everybody everybody hello hello my name is David and on the camera with me today is James hello James and James is excited to all of you, the kids. And just look, one male lion just woke up. Just see how lucky you are. Look at that bo big boy. Look at the size of that male going down. Boom. One thing I will let you boys and girls know, what you just saw was a boy. Just like we have boys and girls, for the lions, we also have boys and girls. So the one that was just walking, and you saw it, walking there that was a boy and I'm saying it's a boy because he had this huge amount of mane or hair around the neck and on the head so that's a boy so just like how you boys and girls are different even for the lions and the lions got boys and we got girls most important I'm sure sitting told you we are very happy when you ask us questions if you see something interesting, please send us a comment. So your questions through the teachers will be making us feel so good. And that way will maybe make these lions wake up. Christopher, that's a very good question. And you'd like to know how many lions live here. We got hundreds of lions in Africa. In the Masimara, I think, we may be having about maybe 100, maybe to 200, Christopher. But at the moment, I got two with me. I got two males. The one you saw walking is bigger brother of the other ones just laying down there, Christopher. I love your question. So I would say we got like thousands of lions in Africa, in the Masimara or in Kenya, we got hundreds of them. But at the moment, I got two and both of them are males. And hopefully, yeah, one just looked up. All right, James, if you swing back to that one, look at that one, Christopher. Can you see the mane? Sometimes we call it like a mohawk and you can see the amount of wind that is blowing. Look at the grass blowing there and look at the mane of that big lion there. Isn't that wonderful boys and girls to see? Ayana, that's a very good question. You're now looking at that one and you're asking how big they can get. Some of them could be so heavy, maybe like an elk. I'm sure you know what an elk is. And some of them are heavy as much as 500 pounds, Ayana. Can you imagine? 500 pounds. That's the weight of a fully grown male lion. They are big like elk 
or like small little cows and they are in general the males are much bigger in size than the females so anything 400 450 pounds sometimes some of the males like the one that we're just seeing here could be about 500 pounds in weight we'll go back to you there to the same male lion because he got his head up and you can see his mane is much darker we might be lucky to see the other one much later on but he's still laying down but it has much shorter mane than we have there look at those beautiful eyes and the grass blowing there you boys and girls are very lucky he turns looks the other way and I can tell you stay there remember questions comments will make a lot of difference for us and now when you talk of animals we talk of about fauna and when you talk about trees and flowers we talk about flora and I got my brother by the name of Steve who wants to talk to you about something called flora or a tree Well, good afternoon, boys and girls. You're back here in the Sabi Sands in South Africa, and I'm showing you a big tree there. I'll explain exactly why in a moment. First of all, good afternoon. My name is Steve Falconbridge. I'm joined on camera by Sebastian Rombi, and we're out here in the African wilderness. And the reason I was looking at that tree is this morning we had two male leopards in that tree feeding on an animal. So hopefully we can find them but last we saw they were here somewhere this morning but we're gonna see if we can scratch around there's a watering hole just around the corner and maybe he's gone there to drink could be lucky as David has said please send through your questions with your teacher let us know what you'd like to see but my plan for the next little while is to see if we can find one of the two leopards we saw this morning hello Kaylee you want to know how many different types of animals live in this area Wow I hope you're going to keep a list and see how many we can show you, but there's lots and lots off the top of my head. Wow, maybe 20 different easily seen mammal species. Uh, lots of birds, we get over 350 birds. The insects, I couldn't count for you, there's thousands of them. And lots of reptiles, at least 30 odd reptiles as well, possibly more. So keep a list and see if you can find as many as you can. We'll show you as many as we can. This is the dry season, so it's a little bit easier to find animals in the dry season because uh, the leaves and the trees have disappeared and there's very little water. So they're all walking to a watering hole where we're about to go, to go and drink. But I'm keeping my eyes on the road because if a male leopard walked here, he would leave a very nice track in the sand. But there's a nice pathway that goes through there. Let's come up here and see if we can find him. He is the reigning Duke of Juma. His name is Tingana. Hello, Kamari. You want to know what a safari is? Well, the word safari, I think it's Swahili. It's an African language. And it actually means to go on an adventure in search of big game under starry skies in Africa. I think I got that a little bit right. Maybe not 100% right. But it's to go on an adventure out in the African wilderness looking for big game and to be under the stars. Isn't that marvelous? But the, obviously the term is being used now for people to come out here and to go on game drives and to come and stay in camps and to move around the African wilderness. Back in the day when the word safari came out, people used to come here with, with ox wagons and horses and hundreds of people carrying their belongings. Nowadays, well, you just jump on board one of these very nicely um, fuel-operated vehicles and we drive you around. But there are also lots of walks available. We're not doing any walking today, but bushwalking is the best and most carbon footprint free sort of um, ability we have out here. We're coming up to the watering hole now. We're just keeping our eyes very well peeled because if there's a leopard, he might be sitting somewhere in the shade. Well, we're gonna scratch around here, see if we can find him, but Sydney's doing something similar. He's going to another watering hole. Let's see what he's found that side. I have got one of the very lovely animals, and his name is the water bark. 
the water bug. The name has got something to do with here where he is now. This animal we are seeing there now is not very far away from the water hole. They prefer to feed right not very far away from the water hole. That is a male water bug. Both of them are males because the males they carry horns. Can you see the water now? So it's where the name water bug derived from. So these animals, for feeding purposes, they always concentrate very close to the water holes. So that's why the name is associated with the water holes, a water bug. Look at that. Beautiful with the round ring at the back. So that round ring serves as a follow me sign. When they are walking in a group, you will see the babies, for them to see where the adults are going, they must have to look right on the back and then keep following. So if you look at the body hairs, Ania, unfortunately, here in South Africa, we have got the areas which are fenced it's not open like going to some of the african countries so unfortunately the animals in south africa they don't migrate they are only spending most of their time in the game reserves and some of the national parks so the males carry horns females water bugs they don't carry horns at all so when a group of males together is like this, we call it a bachelor head. You can see that the one at the back is trying to listen. Maybe because we do have predators in the game reserve, maybe they're trying to pick up some of the things happening that we don't see where we are. There we've got a small water bark. So that is a small water bug, is together with those adults. Look at those very beautiful big horns. So now let's go to the giraffe. Giraffe, but a different type of a giraffe to the one that Sydney showed you just a little bit earlier. And that's because we're not in South Africa, we are here in the Masai Mara of Kenya. But first, I have to introduce myself to all of you. A very good afternoon, special warm welcome to the students joining us this afternoon. My name is Janie, and this afternoon, a gentleman called Manu is hiding behind the camera. Now, we're looking at all of these giraffes gathered here in Kenya, and you've been asking Sydney about whether or not the animals migrate in South Africa. As certain birds definitely migrate, but most of the big mammals do not migrate in South Africa. But here, where we are in Kenya, at this time of year, this is when tourists all come running to see what is known as the Great Migration. Now, giraffe don't migrate. They pretty much stay in one place. But there are other animals, like zebra and wildebeest, that come all the way from a different country, from Tanzania, all the way here to the Masai Mara. So we're here in Kenya, and that's exactly what we're focusing on, is a big migration. Now, what's interesting is that way back a long time ago, there was, in fact, a migration in South Africa. So animals did used to migrate. But very, very sadly, they've stopped doing that. And I don't think you'll even be able to guess why that is. And the answer to that is because people arrived in much bigger numbers than they used to be, and they put up fences. Now, even a giraffe as tall as a giraffe is would struggle to jump over wire fence that you might see around a farm. I don't know if any of you have been visiting farms, but you know those types of fences that they have around there? That is what stopped the biggest migration in South Africa. And it's a problem that there is here as well in Kenya, but it's not as bad. And fortunately, there's not too many fences for the animals to have to walk around. Now, during this whole migration, while these giraffe wander along, they actually, the animals actually have to cross a river. Ah, 
But before we go into that, Darwin, you want to know how do we keep ourselves and the animals safe? Well, first of all, for ourselves, we spend a lot of time looking at these animals. So although they can be dangerous, even, even a giraffe, although really not really, um, even a giraffe could potentially kick a human. We spend so much time with these animals and they spend so much time with us that we, they are used to us and we're used to them. So something like a lion doesn't want to eat you. It just needs to be used to the vehicles so that it doesn't get a fright when it sees them. So we're always watching and they've grown up since they were very small seeing vehicles, which is why we're safe. Even though it's not a closed vehicle, they're never going to come and jump into the car with us. Now, as for what we do to protect the animals, well, Darwin, just a few days ago, it was International Ranger Day. So rangers are people who focus really hard on keeping wildlife safe, and they do that by different ways. So they will go and look for snares. Now, a snare is a wire thing set out by poachers to catch animals, and that causes them really serious injuries or that might even kill them kind of like a loop of wire that tightens every time the animal pulls it. But rangers <coughs> go out and they collect those things and they get rid of them and they make sure that the animals are safe. They also make sure that they are, there are no illegal poachers coming to hurt the animals. <coughs> Excuse me. And they also will teach people around the wilderness areas all about the wildlife because that's what's most important. People need to understand animals and that's how we help as well. People need to understand animals because by understanding them, they'll start to care for them and by caring for them, they'll want to protect them. So it's a long answer to a difficult question. But that is essentially one of the ways in which the animals are kept safe. So here in the middle of the Mara Triangle, these animals are really, really safe thanks to the efforts of rangers who help to protect them. And the giraffe don't know anything about it. As far as they know, these funny people come along and take their pictures and then move off again. And they can carry on their day just as they would have 600 years ago. Now, this particular giraffe is known as a Maasai giraffe. And that is because we're in the Maasai Mara, which is inhabited by the Maasai people. Oh, there's lots of them here. Do any of you know what you call lots of, lots of giraffe? What is the collective noun? Oh, someone's tired. I know the feeling giraffe. Do any of you know what the collective noun is for a group of giraffe? known as a journey of giraffe, which I think is a really lovely word. Isn't that beautiful? Now, while the giraffe of the Maasai Mara might be a perfectly safe out here, or from people out here, there is one animal that they definitely don't want to encounter, and David's with them. Nouns or names of animals. I'm also going to teach you the collective name for lions. If you see a group of female lions together, maybe with the young ones like the cubs or sub adults or like, you know, medium aged animals, uh, lions, you'd call them a pride of lions. But here, as I said earlier, I got two males. And when you get two males together or two boys, so when you say males, I mean boys, when you get two boys together, you don't say a pride of lions, but you say a coalition of lions, all right? A coalition of lions. These lions of mine today, they're still very sleepy. I don't know why they're so lazy, but don't be surprised. Lions sleep a lot. I don't know which other animals you'll tell me today back home that sleep. I'm sure you know cats, domestic dogs, and you know lions are cats, they sleep a lot. If you do not know they were here, you could very easily come and just stumble on them. So, because the grass is just blowing. So cats sleep a lot, dogs sleep a lot. And here in Africa, for all the wild animals I know, the lions sleep a lot. 
Lemar, fantastic question, and you just got the words from my mouth. And you'd like to know, Lemar, how long they sleep for. And they sleep for anything between 20 to 22 hours. And that's more so in the males, anything 20 to 22 hours. So Lemar, what I'm trying to say, they spend most of the days sleeping. But also the females might also sleep as much. So long as the females also have enough to eat, they have no reason not to sleep but in general lions tend to sleep a lot i want to show you the magic we're doing to all of you kids and if you look at the tablet here i want to point to you the map of africa jim's going to punch into map of africa there so top left on your screen what you can see black there that's the map of africa and that's where we are so when you're with sydney or steve down in south africa he was here and then our final control we got a girl kurt began she's doing a very good job she brings you all the way to that yellow patch there and that is east africa and now we're going to look at east africa how it looks like so in east africa you can see that's uganda tanzania kenya but we also got another country there that we call rwanda that is part of east africa so this is kenya and that's where david james Jimmy and Manoa. And right on this spot here, that is the famous Masrimara. And that's where we are coming to you live. You can imagine the distance from South Africa to East Africa. So this is exactly where me and Jimmy, Manu and James are sitting to bring you this wonderful uh, shot. Let's see if these lions might wake up again. And if they don't, we'll try and request them to wake up so that we can see the beautiful head again. One tried to put the head up a little bit, it is not. And that tells you what I was saying earlier, lions are very, very lazy. But that does not mean they're lazy in that sense. They just tend to conserve their energy. And when they sleep like that, they're keeping their energy close to them. You see the wind, how it's blowing on the grass? If these were not lions, they could be different animals, for example, antelopes, impalas, for example. You could see the worry in them, but lions in general are not scared by the wind. We have always called lions sometimes the kings of the jungle because they don't have as many or as much enemies. But if this were other types of animals like impalas, for example, or waterbucks, for example, which you might see today, you'd see when the wind blows, it confuses them and it makes them a bit nervous. But these lions here are just taking it easy and saying life is good because nobody would bother them if they may have to move from where they are now is only maybe if we see elephants passing here we have seen elephants can come here and they might like you know intimidate them and the lions will wake up but as it is now is what we call la la land and they're just enjoying the snooze look at that all right one of my colleagues have something that these lions love to eat, especially now when we're just about to see the migration. Let's find out what they might maybe have tonight for dinner. I bet you've never seen so many animals together all at once, but we, well, you're gonna have a chance to. My name is Taylor and on camera with me today is Archie and we are sitting just like David in the Mara Triangle in Kenya, except we've got a few more animals than David and those animals over there are called wildebeest and wildebeest and zebra and a few other animals do a huge migration. So migration means that they travel very, very far in order to try and find food. So would you believe me that these animals have come all the way from the plains of the Southern Serengeti in Tanzania. So that's a whole different country. And every year, once a year, they make their way up to the nice green grass here in the Maasai Mara and the Mara Triangle and a few other areas too. But isn't that absolutely beautiful? Now, you might be able to see all the way down there, you can see the river. That's the big great Mara River where all those cars are. They've come from all over the world to come and see uh, the, the migration. You can see some more wildebeest coming in. Unfortunately, it's difficult for us to see those. So there's not really a spot. So we're just going to watch from the in this little spot and then we watched some crossings earlier and it's so 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 scary for them because there's crocodiles in the water sometimes they have to jump off steep banks and then there's also we had an incident where there were some lions around too 
Now, it seems as though we're having some internet problems, but I think it's because there's a big storm on its way, which we're going to run away from. So off you go back to South Africa, to Sydney. It was very much interesting learning about migration. I do have something very much interesting right in front of me. Look at that. All the hippos from that corner are out just enjoying the sun. You can see them just lying on the sand there with quite a lot of beds on them. So now, when the hippos are out like this, this gives an opportunity birds to come and eat the ticks from the bodies. So the birds are getting food there. Those birds that you are seeing covering those hippopotamus, they are birds which are called the oxpeckers. Look at them now with the babies, they are frightened. Something disturbed them a little bit. They're not sure what exactly happened. Maybe those birds, as they were flying up, disturbed the hippos resting. But it is still a very good sighting. Listen to that. That is how the hippos makes calls. Uh, Darwin, the hippopotamus can survive up to 40, 45 years. Some of them, they die when they're about 30 years. It doesn't have quite a lot of predators. Yes, some animals such as lions, sometimes they try them, but most of them, they can be very much dangerous. They can easily defend themselves. These animals, Darwin, they have got very big teeth. It's never easy for a small animal to take a hippopotamus down. So look at that other one trying to scratch there. All the birds are coming back now just to land on those ones. This is cute. You can see that the one lying down is not interested. So these animals, they've got to come out most of the day in order to cool their body temperatures. And look at that one is trying to push the other one back doesn't want that one to. Let's see, maybe it's gonna get a heavy kick there. Uh, Lima, the hippo put, look at that, look at that. What this hippo just did now is what the rhino couldn't do. Rhinos and hippos, there's quite a very big difference between these two. A rhino, in terms of the size, is way much bigger than the hippopotamus. And the hippopotamus has got very short legs. Rhinos, they've got short legs, but they are a little bit larger than the one for the hippopotamus. And hippos, they don't have horns. Whereas the rhinos, they do have horns. You will see them here, we have got rhinos with two horns. And again, something different is that the hippopotamus, if you can check very nicely, the arrangement of the eyes is high up on top of their head. And the rhinos, the eyes are a little bit much lower. And the tooth of the rhinos, they are not coming out like the hippos when it's opening. You will see they've got these very big canines and they've got a big mouth. That is the difference between the hippopotamus as well as the rhinos. And rhinos are active during the day. Hippopotamus, we are seeing them here where they are hiding, but they have to come out for feeding purposes during the night. So you can see that uh, the other ones. Okay, Lee, the largest animal we have got here in Juma Game Reserve, it is the largest land mammal. Our largest mammal is the elephant, and elephant is the largest land mammal in the whole world. We do have that animal here in Juma Game Reserve. Look at that hippopotamus loading quite a lot of birds. But I'm sure that those birds, they are not even adding any amount of weight there. These animals can weigh males up to 1,500 kilograms, and the, the, the females, they weigh much less.
Look, look at that. He's trying to shake the body so that they can fly away. <laughs> so sometimes these birds, when these animals got wounds, they try to scratch the wounds to try and get hold of the blood. They eat blood as well. Some of the birds are even uh, leaving their droppings on top of the body there. You can see the white markings. When those white markings are dry, it can take very much time for them to get dissolved. I have seen that on some of the rocks and some of the termite mounds, the bed droppings, they don't get washed very easily. It seems like this hippo is still very much interested to lie down there because by the ground, by the sand, it's nice and warm. I am sure that is what that hippo is looking for. So while I am looking for these rhinos and other interesting animals here by the dam, Steve, one of my colleagues, is going to show you something on food on the other side. Yes, well, we're still looking for that leopard. He's just vanished. But you can see this pathway that I'm walking on. This is a very, very well-made pathway. It's made almost exclusively by hippopotamuses, those big animals Sydney is showing you. So it's a good place to come and have a look because the hippo goes to and from water. So they come out at night to go feeding. They go eating out in the grass, and this is a nice pathway to the water. So often you get animals walking along. It's a nice place to look for tracks. Right, just like we like to drive on the road, animals like to walk on the ground, especially leopards, because it's very quiet over here. They can walk very quietly. But if they walk on the grass, through the bushes, it's very, very different. Lots of grass and sticks and things for them to stand on. So it's a good place to check. But there's nothing on this path, so we're going to go around a bit and see one of the other pathways and see if this male leopard we're looking for is possibly over there. But they are quite difficult to find, male leopards. They're not easy. They don't just say, hello, I'm over here. Well, one of them does. His name is Hosanna, and hopefully we'll get to see him this afternoon. He is my firm favorite in the leopard world. When we don't find him, he often just pops out and just goes, hello, I'm here, boys and girls. So hopefully he'll do this afternoon. But we're doing a big loop around the block to see maybe if he's come out. And if he hasn't, he's probably inside. Hello Nicholas, you want to know what kind of plants? Well, we've got lots of trees. Here's some trees right above our head. This one here, and this tree's actually got quite a nice little magic trick to it. I'm going to have to jump whoop, ah, to grab it. Here is a very nice little pod. Look at that pod. This is one of our bush willow trees, and it's got a nice little trick that you can do. First of all, it's very pretty. And second of all, if you do this, are okay, you ready? Okay. Are you ready? Have a look. Wow, look at that. There's the seed inside. And that seed, if we take it out and we can plant that new tree, you can take these and you can make them to very nice tea, actually. Very, very cool. But that will grow into, into that. I think that's always marvelous. So that's one of the trees. There are many, many trees around. And here's another tree over here that Seb can show you. Um, it's got lots of thorns, and this is one of the trees that the elephants and the giraffe really, really like to feed on. You see those thorns, though? The thorns are there and designed to stop the animals from eating them, but they don't stop them. They just slow them down, really. But that is a very nice tree, the buffalo thorn. So there are lots of trees. There's hundreds of, of trees and grasses in and around. I think it's about 100 grasses and probably about 200 trees or so that, that I could probably name quickly off the top of my head. No, I'm joking. I don't know all of them. But there's lots. So we're in the savannah, so there's trees and grasses and lots of them. And they like to grow in different areas depending on the soil. And some of them are very well eaten by the elephants and by the animals and some are not really. I hope that answers your question. We could talk all day about it, really. Lots and lots of plants. Okay, well, while we keep searching for tracks of this elusive male leopard, let's go back to Sydney, who is still at the watering hole.
I managed to find one of the lovely reptiles. I can see that it's very relaxed at the moment and you will see it nicely just now. Look at that. Fantastic. I have got one of the very, very much aggressive, dangerous reptiles, the crocodile. And looking at that head is telling me that that crocodile is a male because the males, they have got a very thick head. Their head are very much broad. Females, they have got a very thin head. You can see when that crocodile is resting, you can even see the tooth showing there. Sometimes these crocodiles, you will see, they, they open the mouth. When the mouth is closed like this, it means the body functioning is not that very warm. Once the body gets warm, you must have to then open the mouth in order to cool the body temperature. If you look right on top, the skin it looks very much hard. So the crocodile skin at the back, it is like a bulletproof. It's very much hard there. And they can easily use it to camouflage when they are underwater. These animals can see very, very well. Crocodiles, they've got a very good eyesight. And at night you see their eyes turns red. is not moving at all and sometimes some of the animals can be able to approach this very dangerous animal not seeing the crocodile look at that it's matching the surrounding and this is the water he's staying he's staying right in this water hole so the crocodiles by the dry season Jesaya, I didn't copy your question very nicely. I just picked up snakes and crocodiles. If the FC, you can repeat that question for me. Uh, the snakes and the, and the crocodiles, they are not only amphibians here. We do have some of the animals such as the frogs. Frogs are also amphibians. You can find them in water and on land. It's just that by this time of the year, frogs are hiding, but they will come back during the rainy season. So this crocodile can rest there from now until dark. They spend much of their time outside because they depend on the heat from the sun. When the sun is burning like this is when they are enjoying the most. But sometimes they go in and out just to cool the body a bit when the sun is too hot. Uh, yeah, the crocodiles are very much opportunistic and they are not selective at all. Crocodiles, they manage to catch animals such as impalas coming to drink. They even catch big animals such as the zebras. They can be very much dangerous. And their mouth structure is very much strong. When they open that mouth, closing it, they've got a very strong muzzle to close. Opening it is much, much easier. To close it is very hard, and once it catches something, it's going to lock there. Their tooth can be very much sharp, and they don't stop growing. When, whenever they lose some of the teeth, they will grow them back again. It's a lovely animal, and this is an animal, I can promise you, which can survive for up to 150 to 200 years. I wish I was a crocodile, hey, eh? in order to live for such many years. Still not moving at all since our arrival. They don't eat every day, and they don't eat every week. So they don't have to eat today, they don't eat tomorrow, they will take time, sometimes some up to a year. So, but let's go to Mara. I've got some other colleagues who got something very, very interesting for you.
So I was just explaining to you that some of these crocodiles, they can eat after a very long time. So the thing is, crocodiles, they've got to come and wait. Sometimes when it's difficult, they can be able to come very far away from the dam and just wait there. Because they're not too sure when the animals are going to come to drink. These animals, how they eat is phenomenal. They don't have to chew what they're eating. They just have to cut piece of meat and swallow them like that. Sometimes you'll see the crocodiles crying. They cry. And a lot of people, they think they are crying because they have caught something and they are just trying to be sorry about it. No. What causes the crocodiles to cry is the following. When they are swallowing the meat, they swallow the meat with quite a lot of air. And this air then triggered some of the tears glands. And that is when you will see the tears coming from the side of their, of their head. I love crocodiles. This is my favorite reptile. And they do have So now, while I'm still searching some of the interesting stuff around the very same dam, let's see, I do have Steve. Steve is having something interesting to share with you. Yes, well, we haven't found anything yet in the form of a leopard, that is, but we're checking all the areas we could have been. The last place you've seen this morning was in there. So I'm doing what the leopards do. They walk up onto these termite mounds, they come up on the other side and they go very flat, very flat. And then they look for any prey animals. Like I can see you, but you can't really. Yeah, I suppose you can't see me. I stand out like a, stand out like a sore thumb. But the leopards will often come up on top of these termite mounds. These are big mounds in the ground that termites have made to, to grow their own food or to grow fungus that will then break down the food. They're looking for grass, just like this which they're going to take inside and turn it back into nutrients, back into the soil. We have many, many species that live inside these termite mounds, these holes that go inside here. There's another hole over here, not very big hole, but lots of animals live inside. And the leopards that we're looking for love to climb on top to have a look because they get a little bit higher, you see. When, you, when you're only an animal about this tall, you need to get a little bit higher so you can kind of sneak around. Some of us that are short like to use termite mounts to get a bit of size perspective. But um, we've come all the way around. We're going to check one more time just around the corner here because you've done the whole loop around. So there's only one other place he could have been. And that was somewhere over here. Anyway, we're going to jump back in the vehicle. We're going to be going all the way back to the Masai Mara with my very good friend David who's found you some marvelous zebra. Thank you, my brother Steve. And boys and girls, we got something very interesting for you before we finish our drive. And I'm sure this should ring a bell. We got some zebras here. All zebras are black and white, and I would want you to compare. Tell me through your teachers, which animal back home do you think is a cousin or a relative to the zebras? And I'm sure you all know because you're all bright children, it is the horse. The horse is the closest cousin of the zebra. So sometimes we call the zebras here, you know, cousins of the horses. And this particular zebra, we call it the bachelor zebra or the common zebra. And the lions do love these zebras. We showed you earlier with Taylor, the wildebeest, and I told you the lions love wildebeest. With a choice, we'll go back to the zebras now. With a choice, when the lions are given a choice, They'll always go to the wildebeest number one, and then the second choice, they'll go to the zebra. See how beautiful they are. And when I'm saying they're similar to the horses, the hooves, they go like one hoof like the horses, and their hooves are not divided like you see in giraffes or in antelopes, it's only one. And if you look carefully, the face of these animals also look like the horse. They also got the mane like the horse. The only one difference I would say between the zebras and the horses, they are not as fast. The zebras don't run as quickly as the horses. You can see them flicking their tails left to right. And you see that green patch there? 
that green patch is like a small spring and you see it's greener than the surrounding area because it has lots of water and the zebras will come here to have a drink. Earlier we were learning about the, com the group names of the animals. Marco, how are you? And that's a wonderful question. What kind of food do zebras eat? Zebras, as you can see where they are, they're very close to some grass. And zebras are vegetarians. And as you grow older, when you get to about 15 years old, you'll not be saying vegetarians. You'll be saying zebras are herbivores because they only eat grass, anything green. Okay, I am still here at the dam trying to search for some of the very much interesting animals but I can see that these animals now is only the same species around here. It has been very much interesting seeing these crocodiles and the hippopotamus although they were not interacting but they are staring, they are sharing, sharing the very same habitat. So now I've got one of the lovely bears there. That one is called the blacksmith plover. Look at those long legs. Look at how the plover walks. These bears are interesting. When they are threatened, you will see they will fly high up. When they open their wings, right at the end of the every wing, they've got a little bone which is coming out, which is protruding there. That bone is the one that they're using for their defense. It's like they've got a knife at the end of their of their wings. Let's see what, what is trying to catch. Is, is it drinking? Can you see that when this bed is drinking, it's, it's facing down and it must hold the head up so that they can be able to swallow. Some of the beds don't do that. Look at that bed. Look at the reflection of this of that uh, bed walking. Beautiful. It's looking at it's looking at itself. So these are the beds that normally gives us a lot of So these are the beds which gives us quite a lot of signs uh, when it comes to the presence of other animals around the dams. It has been very much interesting having me this afternoon and thank you very, very much for all your questions and comments. It was indeed very much interesting and I hope to host you again. Yes, well, we're doing lots of loops around. Hello, everybody. Welcome to all of you viewers who are always watching the show. You're back with us again, and uh, we are checking out for Tingana. There's no sign of him on the tree from where they were seen this morning. Hassan has peeled off. He's gone east, south somewhere. No idea where exactly. Rexon um, from Voyatella Lodge is assisting us. Uh, he's got a tracker on foot at the moment. Um, he thinks that if he's crossed this road here, then he's probably gone up towards Bufusuk Dam. There's too many animals hanging around these two watering points for him to be around. Rex and things Bufusuk, so we might go up and check that way. But we'll do a bit of a loop around. But these roads sometimes can be very hard. And if a leopard walks across, very difficult to see. Very difficult to see sometimes. There we go. Don't forget to send through your questions. Hashtag Safari Live. We'd love to chat with you. Follow us on YouTube stream. Let us know how you're all doing. This is a very mildly warm afternoon in the Sabi Sands where I only brought one jacket. I think I'm being rather brave, but don't worry, there's a pair of gloves in there. <laughs> Wearing shorts and my, my sandals. So there's a good chance we might get a little bit fresh because it's been very warm this morning and this afternoon the wind is pulling in and it's probably going to be very cold this afternoon. But anyway, we're going to be going all the way back up to the mire with David and his zebra. Well, Steve Ovo, uh, you've got some work to do. If you can, please get me a leopard, uh, whether it's windy or not. I'm sure you're capable. And once you get one, uh, let the leopard know, be it Hosanna, Tingana or Shidulu or Hukumuri that we got some nice food here. We got the common zebra having a little bit of a scratch there. Very unusual place to have a scratch. I doubt whether any kind of parasite would be just above the hoof. There's normally not much uh, far around that area. 
but it's one area also they could very easily pick uh, some ticks or mites as they walk in the grass. See the area they are in now, they have eaten most of the grass there. And we've been talking about migration, and when we talk of migration, we talk of zebras, we talk of wildebeest, we talk of elons and the Thompson gazelles. These zebras here, we think they could be part of the lead of the migration of the animals that are coming now from Serengeti in the south and coming to the north in Kenya. And from what we have heard, it's any time now, any time now, we'll be seeing the hundreds of thousands of the wildebeest coming and Taylor I think was lucky early in the day to see them crossing the Mara River and where they are is the other side of the Mara River and what we call the main Mara and we guys or we folks are in the Mara Triangle and we are counting days before we get this spectacle coming to where we are. As usual flicking the tails because of either flies or something like that or just making sure they're letting the predators know we are alert as much as we are facing the other way eating we are very much alert. And to the left of your screen, you can see the green patch there. I'm sure James can pound that. Gary, thank you very much. Great comment. If you look at that particular patch there, Gary, we have some natural spring there. And this is one of the beauties of the Mara and also of uh, Kruger National Park of the, uh, the Juma Game Reserve. We get patches of land like this where we've got water coming from the underground and apparently this water comes out all around the year unlike say in Juma where we have seasons like winter and summer here we have like summer all around the wind all around the year if we have I would say winter is this month round just coming to end of July but our temperatures tend to remain the same all around the year so this patches of land they remain green and this water do not dry whatever time whatever drought we got in the area it does not dry and that's why you see these zebras here very close to this patch they enjoy the green grass curry and also they'll be drinking water and apparently part of this patch we see here if you look at them on the side some of them could be eating but they also leak lots of salt so this particular area here we call the salt leak area because apart from drinking, they also tend to leak the salt in the patches that are bare. I'm not sure James is going to get any patch that's bare. Exactly, that patch that is bare, that's where these zebras will be leaking the salt. But hearing of mating reptiles, that sounds interesting, isn't it? I have got a very interesting activity taking place at the moment. I have got the two monitor lizards, they are just now mating. So it is now the breeding season for the monitor lizards. So monitor lizards, they also lay eggs. I know these birds, when, when they are mating like this, they tend to become an easy prey. Earlier on, I saw one of the big raptors coming here wanting to grab one of them. So they are just now mating for the second time in front of me. When I got here, I found them mating. Then they were disturbed because this one big, big, big raptor came and wanted to grab one of them. And then they had to disperse. And again, they are back again and they are carrying on mating. So these are the water monitors. I know people, they do have quite a lot of confusions between water monitors and the rock monitors. They look alike. The difference is they are where they are staying. The rock monitors, you find them by the rocks and sometimes they climb trees. They can be able to go in between the branches where their holes, where the, the holes are by the crack trees, they hide in there. Some, they stay by the termite mounds. But all these two species, they do have same tendency of crawling with the tongue going in and out. You'll see they've got a very nice forky tongue and when they're doing that, they can even be able to taste their prey before they catch it, just from the air. From moving that tongue by the air particles, they can be able to test their prey.
So you can see that when they're mating, they become very much vulnerable because they get too relaxed. But you can see that uh, one of them is, is very much active, but the male, and the one I believe is the male is the one on top, uh, this is the one I can see that is, can be very much vulnerable. Anything can just happen to this male if any of the big birds decide to come here. This is something which is very much rare, and I'm seeing it for the second time. Uh, Safari Sali, there is a traditional story which is associated with the reptiles, the monitors. When the monitors are mating, like we're seeing now, it just brings a good luck to the one who have seen them. In other words, myself, Sydney, as well as Senzo, my camera operator, we are very lucky people this afternoon, and we might come across anything very interesting. Thank you very much for that kind of a question. And Sally, we are we are very lucky people today. It's exciting. So I like it when I'm coming across something like this because I know uh, it's going to bring me something good. And I will share. When this lucky comes out, I will share with you. So these birds can grow, these, uh, I'm sorry, these reptiles, they can grow up to 1.5, uh, 1.3, 1.5 meters. But if you can check, the tail is just one and a half size of the whole body size. They might fall in there, they are right on the edge. Said half, yes, the water monitors, they, they've got a very good ability to swim and they can go very fast because they've got that very long tail. Look at that tail. That tail can be able to move them very fast. They do that and they are very good swimmers. I have seen them a lot. It's just that when they're resting, they must come out because they've got same kind of behavior applies to the behavior of the crocodiles. Reptiles, they've got to rely on the sun in order to warm their body temperature. Let's see, Steve is now by Vuyotala Dam. Maybe something is happening by Vuyotala Dam at the moment. Let's see what Steve is showing by the Vuyotala Dam. Thanks, Sydney. Not too much is happening. We just, um, I'm just considering Rexon's idea that Tingana's maybe gone to Bivosuk watering hole, but when there's water here, he's probably just hiding somewhere in the thickets that we just can't see. And uh, he's quite shy on foot, so if we go in on foot, he's going to move. So we've just come back to the other side to what for a tiller watering hole from from Gallego, because there were animals that side. There's no animals this side, so maybe he's secreting himself here somewhere, having a really good look. These leopards, as you know, folks, are very camouflaged, the masters of it, in fact. But we don't see anything. No tracks. I don't see a single track coming out. I'm no expert, but I did look very hard. Um, there is the drainage on the other side. He might have gone through there. He could just be in the bushes close to where he was last seen. He did have an enormous amount of dacre, I think. Why go all the way to Bufelsuk? It just sounds like a, a silly... Not a silly, I didn't mean silly. just sounds like a very long way for him to go if there's water right here. Anyway, we're going to just move out to the area for a little bit and go and see what else is lurking around Juma for the moment and we'll come back here as it starts to cool down and maybe he'll pop out and show himself. That's the plan. It's a lovely blustery afternoon. Animals are going to be hiding in the drainage lines and animals that like to cool off with their very big ears up in the Mara. David has found some elephant. Alright Steve, I'm still waiting for that leopard and now look we got one huge 
male elephants here and again just by virtue of having the green and the water around where he is he is enjoying his time the grass definitely there is a lot softer and definitely much greener which will translate it to being more nutritious and in the background there you can see james is trying to show you the beauty of the mara the open savanna and with the escarpment in the background what you call the Olorolo escarpment and that's what forms the Mara Triangle I think what James was trying to show you there so the escarpment you show they're going to be taking you back there shortly forms one wall of the triangle then we have the Mara River that forms one side of the triangle and the boundary between Kenya and Tanzania that's what you call the Mara Triangle and that's where we are so go back to the elephant again and just see how he is enjoying just approaching the grass from the water which I think is very nutritious And then Ellie comes, well done. And you can see the wind is still picking up. And you notice the Ellie or the elephants not bothered by the green at all like sedge, which definitely is not of much nutrition value. And the grass on the right is dry. That's what we call the red oat grass. It's the Temenda triandria. And of course, Ellie may definitely have better choice of food now. So it picks up, I'm sure, together with the roots and also getting a bit of moisture as it keeps eating. So things doing two things at the same time, eating and drinking at the same time. And of course, they can tell he's a male by virtue of him being there alone and of course by the shape of his forehead. Not many girls around here. It's not warm, it just flops his ear a bit, the left one, but it's not flopping as normally the elephants would do because the temperatures are not as, you know, high. And with the cool breeze blowing, that makes it very comfortable. At a particular age when, you know, males are 20, 30, 40, they tend to live on their own and maybe rejoining the females or the breeding heart when it's time to mate. Beautiful. Katu apple. Sorry, I missed the question for Marcy Megan. <laughs> I hope I got the question from Marcy, the elephants are bigger in the Mara, was that the question? Sorry Marcy, uh, Megan, it's a bit windy here. And if that's the question from Marcy... So sorry Megan, it's very very windy here and it's still uh, Mr. Christian, I can get the Mara part. What's the question for Marcy? Sorry. And if the question is how big is the Mara or how big are the elephant? Gary, your question is, do elephants migrate like other animals? I would say yes and no. Yes, because they will change positions, Gary, from one feeding area to another area. But when it comes to migration, the only animals that we say do migrate will be the wildebeest because they move thousands of miles and they migrate between two countries, Kenya and Tanzania. In Tanzania, they move from a national park called Serengeti and when they come to Kenya, they come here where we are in the Masai Mara. So elephants will do what you call mini migration and that means they change one feeding ground to another ground then come back to where maybe they started. So they tend to go like chakos or zigzags just for breeding, I mean for feeding reasons. But the wildebeest will do that for feeding reasons, number one, and number two also for breeding. That's a very good question Gary. The male elephant now is showing us his back and you can see how the wind is picking up. Eh? See the green sedge, how it's really being moved by the wind. I don't know whether I would want to be 
a male elephant at one point. It's rather a lonely life when you don't have the females with you. And you can tell his feet is pretty wet. And after some time, he'll be leaving this area to go to much drier area. What happens when they stay in the water for so long, they would get some infection, some disease called foot rot, which affect their toes. I would really enjoy to be where he is with a cool breeze, lots of food, lots of water to drink. And again, you know, it's not flapping the ears a lot. Minamu, how are you? And how nice to hear your name again. Well, Minamu, I'm back in Kenya. And you, I think your question is, do the elephants in the Mara live longer than the elephants in South Africa? I would say no, Minamu. They have the same, I would say, lifespan. You're talking about 60, 65 years. So, Minamu, I mean, they are here. We got the savannah elephants or either the air forest elephants. They got the same lifespan. The longevity is the same for the elephants here and the elephants in South Africa. Always a pleasure, Minamu, to hear your name, uh, you know, coming into the question or even throwing a comment. Wonderful. Alrighty, we might be moving on and see whether we may have other elephants not very far from this one as he continues enjoying feeding himself there. All right, Sydney, tell us, what are you doing out of the vehicle? I am now going to check if one of these termite mounds right in front of me is still active or not. I just want to try and check here because some of these termite mounds, you find that they are not active anymore. So, but here on this one, it's very much difficult to tell. I can see these some quite a little bit of um, of of holes here but no recovery nothing maybe it's one of the termites mounds that has been abandoned this one so there's something very interesting i want to talk to you about the queen and the king and how they do things underground here the termites the queen and the king they are always founders of every termite mound and these queen and the kings, you must check, they can be able to regulate who must be the workers and who must be the soldiers. But now, the interesting part is, when they lay eggs, these eggs, soon as they hatch, they blow a pheromone, both male and females. And that pheromone they blow is going to make all these other termites inside workers sterile. Here by the termites, Workers, you can have both male and female. But these male and females, when they are born, they are active to reproduce. Then the gas or the pheromone, which is produced by the male and the female, which is the queen and the king, those are the ones that are going to stop, they are going to block the reproductive activities. And the interesting part is, if the queen dies, and the king dies this is what is going to happen and this is going to be very much interesting if the queen dies because is the one who was blocking the reproduction to take place by these other newborns it means now the newborns are not going to have that gas which stops them the pheromone which stops them from breeding so it's only when the queen and the king dies or one of them dies one of these other workers is going to be inaugurated and become a queen and reproduce so you can see that these uh, insects, they are very much clever. They are born active to reproduce, but they can be able to control it. And if they want to open it, they just don't have to give out the gas. If they give out the pheromone, then it means uh, they are not going to reproduce. So now I am going to be heading towards the central part of the game reserve and see if we can find some of the interesting cats. Now I'm I'm going to change the gear. I'll be looking for some cats now. <laughs> Dial, the termites, they can be able to do what is called nomadism, not real migration. They can move, they can abandon an old nest and start somewhere not very far away. They move 
suffering under the ground. So it's not a real migration, but that is determined by what is happening. The predator, sometimes they can move a termite and they can be able to start it somewhere not very far away. Termites underground are very much well connected. So one of the difference between So now I am going to be entering the central part of the game reserve. While going there, I have got another colleague, Steve. He's also looking for some cats. Let's see, maybe Steve already picked up tracks. Yeah, no tracks, no sign. But uh, maybe if we hang out with these impala and that warthog, maybe something will materialize. There we go. There's a nice. Oh, hang on. What's going on? A little bit of jumpy jumpy. It is a little bit windy, as I said, folks, so the animals like to hang out together. And there that impala is having a bit of a toilet stop because it's hard work running around in the African wilderness. There we go, photo bombed. <laughs> the warthog is quite enjoying the company, I think, because um, impala have got pretty decent eyes. Warthog don't have very good eyes. I've had many times I've found warthogs on walks and they've been kind of walking on a pathway towards me and I've made all the people with me just sit down right there on the path and as long as you don't move at all and you keep your shape quite low the warthogs have no idea you're there and they'll walk and they'll walk and they'll walk they're trying to be very observant but I don't think they've got the best eyesight in the world and also they're quite low to the ground I don't think they've figured out how to go climb up on top of termite mounds to get a better vantage point Although we did see an impala a few weeks back, probably a month or so ago already. Senzo myself, an impala standing very alert on top of a termite mound, and it was no alarm call. But that gave away the presence of Shadulu, that beautiful leopardess from the west. And Senzo and I managed to follow her for quite some time. That's the last time I saw her. But these impala are feeding. No pressing danger anywhere nearby. So we're going to continue on down into the Umawati drainage, just around here. Um, Rexon is working on the other side there. There's still no tracks of this cat. So anyway, maybe Hosanna will materialize somewhere around here. Maybe Tingana will just pop up out of nowhere. Anyway, we're going to find you something soon. It's just nice to be out, really. So I think, as I said before, that tomorrow, oh, hang on, we found an animal. I just saw, oh, there's another one. Two animals, a giraffe and a water buck. You see how the animals like to hang out together when it's windy? Because um, it's always good to hang out with the tallest in the variety, the giraffe, because he can see much further than the rest. It gives you time to put your head down. In the case of the giraffe, put your head in. What bush has he got there? An interesting bush. It's a bit of a mixture. There's a woolly caper bush growing up through what looks like a buffalo thorn. And uh, talking about that on the school drive, uh, the giraffe can stick their faces right in there. Sorry, Seb, I was having a look with the binoculars a second there. There he's busy feeding. Nice and light colour. Some people will always assume the light-coloured giraffe are female. That's generally the case, but you do sometimes get males that are quite light in colour, as I think is the case here. Oh, hang on, he's got a partner. Comes the second one. They are very sort of feminine-looking creatures, giraffe. You know, if you don't know the trick of identifying the thick ossicones on the top of the head, you'd probably think most giraffe are female by those enormous beautiful eyelashes that are the envy of all the ladies out there some of the men as well I suppose and those eyelashes serve the purpose of protecting the face inside there when it goes into the branches giraffe girl of course you, your name always comes up when we see giraffe I know how exciting it makes how exciting it is for you well I'm glad we could accommodate Beautiful, beautiful individual. Sorry, Seb, you were trying to show me that water buck before, weren't you? 
is a nice sort of resident male to the area and we're not far from twin dams at the moment probably a hundred, few hundred yards no, he's not gone very far at all but those enormous rapier like horns and we've had I've had a couple at least one standoff with Tingana and a waterbuck who looked at Tingana and Tingana thought twice about it it's just too big an animal really with that very characteristic white bottom or the ring and it was interesting to see both types of waterbuck up in the Mara the defasa as well as what is this called the common I don't know I've always just known it as the water buck being the bulk grazer that they are not really competing with the impala the impala being very selective in their feeding and obviously no competition with the giraffe that span to the heights feeding on the leaves of the trees so a nice sort of symbiotic sort of um, cooperation or mutualism out here where they're all protecting each other in a way although they don't really care about each other it's all selfish hang out in groups so that someone will get picked off off the edge hopefully not me now joy they do have a marvelous set of horns indeed the water buck And constantly f swatting that tail away so you see how he feeds and then looks up feeds and then looks up because he's with a group he can spend a lot more time with his head down which obviously allows them to get more food in per time out feeding but when they're on their own you see it with rutting in parlor males their head is up constantly so they're just not getting any food in and with no food gets lower energy and gets loose condition and then they get picked off and selected off by all sorts of individuals that are out looking for the weaker in the variety and how exciting we're going back up to the Masai Mara and David has got a bird we don't very often see down here in Juma yes this is very exciting and uh, apparently I don't know, I was with Steve on one of the drives, one of, you know, a few months ago in South Africa, and I had a viewer who asked me, which is the largest bird in Africa? And my answer was a pelican. I've always felt so guilty up to this day, because I do not know how I forgot the ostrich. And I think I was only looking at the birds that do fly because we all know ostriches do not fly. But the same day, the same time, I profusely apologized and I said, no, the largest birds are the ostriches. He is moving a bit fast. You've got two types of ostriches in Kenya, what you call the Maasai ostrich and the Somali ostrich. He's moving a little bit out of frame. What I want to do, I want to reposition a little bit and see whether it can get a little closer because it's always exciting to see ostriches. So James Holden right there and one of the strengths of the ostriches is speed and strength. So if they are under any challenge of any kind because they face a few enemies, I'm talking about lions for example, if they are under challenge for their lives the first thing they do is to take off and they're very fast just like the cheetahs they would comfortably do 60 80 miles an hour very very fast bats. but if cornered the first thing or the second thing they will do for defense is to kick and they kick very hard eh? you don't want to be kicked by an ostrich and if worse comes to us they may turn around and they'll poke you know maybe into your eyes using their beaks i've seen them poking uh, a young lioness but I think it was a lioness trying to learn how to hunt on the eye and the eye almost you know put it out so speed strength of your feet and using their beaks for defense we are caught up with him here and I would want you to tell me he is black and white and I'm sure you might tell me do you think he is a male or a female it may sound a very simple question but too many people it might challenge them to tell is it a male or a female these are some of the birds that are very clear in their sexual dimorphism while males are very different from the female this particular
particular one, we call him the Maasai ostrich. They'll be feeding on seeds from the grass they're walking through. They'll pick small insects, like most birds will pick anything. They get small fruits. Hello there. Good to see you, the elephant. And just, uh, you know, moving his wings to try to cool off and balancing. And the beautiful Taylor got another big mammal around this area of the Masimara. Unfortunately, you're just going to see literally the tail end of these elephants as they disappear into a tree line. I was hoping that they were going to cross the Mara River because we're quite close to cul-de-sac and I have seen many elephants actually crossing this section, even though it's quite deep, which you'd think is a little bit unusual for the young calves around. But mom holds on tight and they all manage to get across together. But like I said, that is our sighting going now. And um, I can't do any DNCs, drive and chats like I normally do because for me to drive, I have to do this. Amazing, right? So yes, so they like to feed in this area along the banks of the river, as you can imagine. The same thing goes in the, in the Sami sand. <laughs> But um, we'll get more into that. I'm going to go and try and find some more elephants. So while I do, it seems as though David has still got those birds with the very long legs. And what you see, like what you'd call the sea of grass, is when the wildebeest will be coming here. In a couple of days, and I think Taylor may want to confirm that with me, all this grass will be gone. They'll be eating it, they'll be rolling on it and making it easier for the termites, you know, to feed on it. Sorry, James, I didn't mean to bounce you there. I know you're a strong boy. And all this grass will be gone. I am still really thinking of following that ostrich and seeing how tall a bird he is walking on the savannah. Look, look at the speed of that guy, James. See how they can get him run. And look at the, what I would call the drumsticks. It's quite a distance. I'm sure James can get it. And what a beautiful bird. It's big legs, huge drumsticks. And I'm sure one drumstick can fit as many people. I mean, I'm all good to hear you again and you're asking how many stomachs does an ostrich have? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I think most birds will have the crop and the usual stomach. I do not know what Minamu you think, but my guess would be right below at the base of that neck, maybe there could be the crop and then the main stomach. I could be wrong, Minamu. I'd be happy if maybe there's something you might have researched, but I would say like most birds, it will have the crop and then the main stomach. What I know people in the village where I come from, we used to eat ostrich a lot. Not anymore now because we are conserving them. And that's why, for example, you have that one there on your screen. But the thing once in a while I've seen the boys in my village doing is collecting their eggs. If they get, you know, some hatchling of about say five, six eggs, they'll pick one, you know, boys will be boys and bring one home. And what the boys will tell me, one ostrich egg is about 20 chicken eggs. Slowly feeding away there. I don't know whether he is going to look for the female as the red oat grass is just being blown by the wind there. Not sure we might be getting some rains later. Maybe yes, maybe not. But very majestic as he is feeding out there. All right, we'll move on. Maybe you might be lucky to see the female. But again, as I said earlier, the black and white ones are the males and the females are always brown in color. But apparently, when they're all young, they all have the same color and they all look brown. All righty. So when they're young, when you see them they're just hatching out, they all br look brown in color. But as they mature, they start defining their colors as a black thread. All righty. Very good, Gemma. Hello, Gemma. And that's a very good question. What animals eat ostrich? I'm not sure I am an animal myself. Gemma, I hope you're also an animal like me. And I'll tell you, 
lions I have known for a fact eat ostriches and once they bring them down I was showing you only the drumsticks there that's the bit they start with because those parts are not covered they have no feathers and I'm trying to imagine a lion trying to pluck out the feathers of the ostrich but they just tear them up and then they get the intestines or the internal organs to reach the good meat but I would say lions do that and I've seen leopards hunting young um, ostrich chicks and occasionally I've seen hyenas doing the same. Alrighty, let's move on and see if we might be able to see the female. It's a very good question, Gemma, to know who actually eats the ostriches. As I said earlier, way back we used to eat ostriches in my village. Any luck with the leopards in South Africa? Maybe? I have got some other very small and tall interesting animals right in front of me here. It is still not very easy to find. Look at that. Fantastic. So he must have to then now swallow and then go down again if he's not done yet. You can see these animals can be able to kick. Oh, we have got the Watrox coming there. I know these Wattoks, they confuse a lot of people with the bush pigs. See the Wattoks, the tooth are coming out, they are all passing by. And this is what is called a sounder. The whole family, a group of Wattoks together. All these Wattoks we are seeing, they are staying at the same place. They are using the same hole. Look at that, beautiful. When the giraffe is drinking, they tend to become an easy prey. You see, these animals, they've got to go down and collect water and stand straight so that they can swallow the water. So they cannot be able to face down for quite a long time. If they, you see what they're doing now, that is a procedure. When the giraffe is drinking, after drinking, they must have to shake the head because before they go down for drinking, they close the valves for the blood flow to avoid the blood to flow up to the brain. So they must have to first drink and then they must shake the head. You will see even the ears hitting the side of the cheeks. That is when they are opening the valves again. Not too sure if he's done drinking or is going to come this side. These animals are not that water dependent. Giraffes, their diet is consisted of fresh leaves. And these fresh leaves have got quite a lot of moisture on them. They, they are not that water dependent. They can go even for about two weeks without drinking water. You must check. They sometimes urinate a very sticky urine in order to conserve the moisture as much as possible. Let's see, maybe he's going to go again for another drink. Giraffe, it is a very uh, beautiful animal indeed. It's one of my favorite. Their movement is very much interesting. One who swiftly, they swift. Let me carry on to the dam and see if we can have a better sighting from there. Paula, I am not too sure in terms of the amount of liters they have got to drink a day, but it is not too much. If you have seen what this giraffe did now, he just got down twice and he did not spend much drinking there. So because of the type of diet they have got, they don't need a lot of water. Everything is just disappearing at the moment. Together with those watoks I can see now and the giraffes, everybody is going away. Oh, they are near. So while I'm still going to look for more other interesting wonders of this world, I am now going to Mara where I Surprise! It's Jamie and Madhu with Hyena. 
and it's taken us all this time since we last saw you to actually find them. As I mentioned, was it yesterday? I have no idea. I've lost track of days completely. You'd think I'd be able to find over 70, at least one of the over 70 members of North Clan somewhere within their territory, but it's taken me all this time and I was starting to get just a little bit stressed because off in the distance is a quite, oh hello, off in the distance is a hyena actually. I take that back, I was going to say storm and of course hyenas are known for hunting in the rain, but we've actually got a hyena cub. Are you coming? No? Oh, okay. Well no wonder it took me so long to find you lot. So I've came past the den about five times, exaggeration, at least three times. And it was only now on this final trip that I spotted Sao, or Sawa, S-A-U-E-R, the mother of the youngest member of North Clan, resting up behind the den. Now as we've been sitting here, I keep seeing heads and ears pop up all over the show. But because these cubs have got so much older... They don't actually necessarily spend their days right at the entrance to the den, and neither do their mothers. So they're all having a little bit of space. There's Sour's hole in her ear. That's the easiest way to identify her, although it's not always visible. Just from the angle, there you go. That's how you will always know that that is Sour. That reddish color of her fur, she doesn't have many spots on her body. Lots of spots around her legs, and then that hole in her ear. And she just looks old, doesn't she? I mean, perhaps I shouldn't say old, perhaps I should say experienced. And she is old. She's one of the oldest females in the clan. What's up, girl? What you hearing? What's happening? Time to go hunting. Now, last night, we stayed with them as it got dark. What's wrong, girl? Oh! And they didn't really get up to all that much. Now I'm going to go around to see what Sal's up to quickly. Off you go across it to Taylor before her bird flies away. Well, we've got lots of birds here. And then I have to remind myself if we get blacksmith lapwings here. Because that looks exactly like one. And then I'm like, duh. That's a very South African thing to say. Obviously, we get blacksmith lapwings. So anyways, that's what that one was. That is not blacksmith lapwing. That one is a black-headed heron. What else do we have? We've got some... There's a grey heron. How cool is that? The larger of the two species that are present at this little little uh, marshy area. Oh, there we go. My absolute favourite. The African sacred ibis. Or the bin chicken. If you're from Australia, you might call these birds because, well, they're known to rub rummage around in the rubbish. And uh, they definitely do so in South Africa as well. But, yeah, there's no rub rubbish for them to rummage around in, thankfully. But it's a beautiful scene. And then we've got one mammal. Wait for it. Hello, Mr. Waterbuck. How art thou today? Good? Just relaxing, enjoying, soaking up the afternoon warmth. It's actually really quite nice here. Uh, at one point when we were a little bit further south of Serena, I was ready to put on about six jerseys because it was freezing, but also the big front, um, big storm was coming on in and the wind was really unpleasant. But now that the sun has poked its head out through the clouds, it's quite beautiful. And why not spend your afternoon, whatever day of the week it may be, I have absolutely no idea what day it is today, but just by ruminating and warming up. Because it was quite, like I said, it was quite chilly earlier. And that's exactly what everyone's doing. So it's not just this beautiful waterback ball that's doing it. That's what all the birds are doing too. Really just warming up. There's two black-headed herons there. Now, I have to say, I think out of the larger heron species, I, I, I do quite enjoy the black-headed herons. Like I said, I'm, I'm fond of them because of their snake-catching capabilities. They're quite impressive. And also catching lots of rodents too. So that's always quite nice to see. I did see, an, and there's some egrets. Can you see those white birds um, center frame, Archie, in the actual marsh? Straight through, um, not those ones. That, yeah, well, there we go. Those are the same ones. Those are great white egrets. Hello. Not the ones that follow the buffalo and elephants and other mammals around. Um, those are the cattle egrets. This one is the biggest of them all. We also see them at Chitwa quite often in South Africa. They're beautiful. 
beautiful birds just looking for frogs i would imagine in there now i'm hoping because this light is just starting to turn really beautifully at the moment um is that we're going to head to a little bit further down we're going to head to a very similar uh, section to this but there's a bit of a lugger a little bit of a, a drainage and within that it's filled up with water and there's quite a few young catfish that are now living in that and from the yellow billed storks there were marabou storks to anything else any, all the herons everyone that likes to fish they're all in there um catching uh, catching some fish so i'm hoping to show you that today a beautiful impala ram not the biggest ram that you'll see in the mara however actually quite a small fella he almost looks like you've come from south africa are you here on holiday perhaps maybe coming to see the migration but as you know, the impala get massive here in the Marum, and I shall show you, hopefully show you some, with a spectacular set of horns. Well, that's the idea anyways. Megan, can you hear me? Can you hear Megan, Archie? I'm just checking. I'm just checking, because I've been having communication trouble. The radio has not been my friend over the last couple of days. It's caused me all sorts of, all sorts of uh, issues. Anyways, we're going to move on to hopefully find a, a good fishing spot. And um, in the meantime, I'm going to send you to Steve, who's watching one of his favorite animals. Yes, well, it's my, one of my favorite animals to watch indeed. The baboon, the chakma baboon. They're up in this very tall, what I think is a river thorn, a big acacia anyway. And they're after the seed pods, the little, little seeds that are inside the pods. And um, there's actually, there was about seven of them up the tree. There's only one left, but watch this one now. He takes the pod and he pops off each of those little coffee bean-like seeds and stores it in the cheek. He actually seems to be eating them. The other ones were storing them in the cheek and then they've come down. They're probably going to go somewhere and, and feed on them at their leisure. There's not a river thorn that. I'm not 100% sure which acacia that is. It's definitely acacia. I thought it was a knob thorn at first when we arrived here, but it's definitely not an upthorn. You see the straight thorns. The river thorn has got the longest thorns in the acacia family, so it's definitely not him, even though there are some long thorns in there. Very funny watching them navigate themselves through this very thorny, spiny tree in search of very good nutrients. Once you break open the seeds, that is. Inside it doesn't taste very good. I don't think but there's a very important forage for a number of animal species in and around these reserves the acacia plant with the seeds that they produce Okay, well, we're going to quickly go away from this baboon stuffing his mouth with acacia pods because Sydney has got an epic battle I have got a very Phenomenal sighting here. I've got two giraffes fighting, two male giraffes fighting. This is very much interesting. Let's see how the giraffe fight. You will see these giraffes, they are going to strangle their necks. Look at that, look at that. See what's going to happen there. You can see they're still aiming at each other. Aiming, aiming. You will see how they're going to do it. So. This kind of a fight of strangling the necks, they hit each other with their oxycones. And if you can check those oxycones on top, because they are males, there's no hairs there. So they lose hairs when they're fighting. Let's see what is going to happen there. They have been fighting for a while. Because since I got here, they were pushing each other. Look at that. That is how they fight, you see? Interesting. So that is how the giraffe fight. And sometimes they can... Uh, Anna Marie, it is very much rare for them to get killed from this kind of a fight. But some of them, you must check, they, because of strangling, they hit 
each other here on the side of the body between the hips and the ribs. Between the hips and the ribs, some of them don't have hairs there because that is where when they are strangling, that horn is scratching all the time. Because of fighting for a long time, sometimes they lose the skin. Those kind of oxycons can be able to open a hole there and you see now the insects coming and sometimes they die because of those kind of injuries. But it's very much rare. It's not something that is happening very often. So you can see that these animals, they don't use their head to defend against the predators. They use their legs because they know that the kind of oxycones or horns they have got is not usable when it comes to fight against the predator. When they bring the head down, then they become vulnerable. So they fight with the horns and they fight predators with the legs. This is beautiful. Joy, this is a real fight. A play fight, it doesn't take very long and just they will just tease each other and they split. But when they're standing like this, uh, uh, strangling the necks like this, you can see this is very much serious. And looking at these animals, the one which is much more on the right, he looks much darker than the other. And these giraffes, when they're getting old, they dominate dark spots. So the other one on the other side is much younger than the one on the right. So this is something I don't see very often. So I'm just gonna pull back for you. Now they are coming again. Look at that. This is beautiful. So you can see that when they are fighting, because these animals don't make calls, when they are fighting, they just fight silently. You can see that that one is about to hook the youngster which is standing on this side. See, if you look at the spots, to us they look, they look the same, but these spots, they are not the same. They're just like our fingerprints. Each one of them has got its own stripe pattern. Look at that, more or less the same kind of height. They're standing very nicely. You can see they're aiming each other. The giraffes can be able to distinguish each other from the pattern. That is why after birth, you must check both male and uh, both female and the young they isolate themselves for a while so that the little one can be able to to learn the sports from the parents and the scent as well their body scent is not the same and for the males you can even pick it up they secrete a very distinctive smell so now i will be looking for more other animals and we can go to mara and see my colleague has got something interesting for you, one of the big. Remember this morning I was telling you about the angriest hippopotamus in the entire world? Here it is. Now, I saw that um, Mr. James Richard said we should call him Charging Charlie. <laughs> I quite like that. It's already opened its mouth at me. Let's see if we're going to get another view of it. Otherwise, Archie... Okay, everybody, I'm going to drive, but you won't see me. But I'm going forward. I'm still here. Enjoy this view. But I have to show you Charging Charlie or Angry Angus. We haven't decided on what its name is going to be. Of course, it's not an official name. It's just a joke. Um, okay, right. Trying to not go too quickly. This is the funniest hippopotamus I've ever met in my entire life. Sorry, Scooter Steve. Okay, you're now going to see some cars. No, well, I, I don't because there's no evading them. Meow, meow. There he is. It is gap now. Don't charging, Charlie. You are misbehaving horribly today. Talk about. Let me just tell you, this hippo is not shy. And now 
because I've told you all about it, of course. Look at the look at the pretend act he's putting on. Oh, there he comes. Let's see. Well, we we're, we're out of the the firing zone now, but we've got some other vehicles. I think it is a male. Last time I checked, I checked it was a male, and it's kind of exactly the same spot that we're in. Look at that glare. I mean, that just says, get away from me, doesn't it? He's so funny. Let's see if he's going to open his mouth at any of the cars, though. He, he, if he's doing it, he won't be doing it to us because we have about hmm, three cars, or two, sorry, I can't do maths, apparently. Um, my high school teachers will probably agree with that. But let's see. Tracy, you said you think Charging Charlie is a great name. Well, I can't take any credit for that. Thank you, James Richard. I saw that on Twitter. Remember, you can interact with us. And we love your suggestions, comments, and I personally enjoy the odd joke. So hashtag Safari Live with any of those. Here he goes. Very quiet today. Hey, Archie? So I wonder if he's just grumpy when he's had the entire night out and perhaps been harassed by lions and things like that and now is feeling a little bit better about himself. I've had a long sleep. Oh, hang on, wait. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pull out in the road. Hello, vehicles. Never mind. We'll just look at you, vehicles. Archie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swing us round. I'm going to block. Watch me. I'm going to do a Mara maneuver and block the entire road now, the whole road, so no one can pass. Bye, Charging Charlie. Sorry, everybody. Now, I bet you all think Taylor's talking absolute nonsense again. He doesn't look angry at all. I promise you, this is the angry hippo. Wait till tomorrow morning. I hope you're all going to watch tomorrow morning because I'm going to come and find him again and it'll be at the exact spot. There, there, there. Ah! <laughs> and that's just what he does. And he does it at you and then he runs towards you and then he stops and he walks away. Now, I mean, he's... He's, he's far away from all the vehicles, he's super far away from all the cars. So he's just, he just, I don't know, doesn't enjoy us at all. But there's not much we can do. I mean, we've given him so much space. We must be close to 100 meters away from him now. And still, and, and all the other cars are just at the same distance away and still. And, uh, and no one's off-roading after him or anything like that. It just, just shows how much he, de you know, he, dis he detests the vehicles. It's so funny. It is so great. But that was quite cool. I'm so happy after telling you about this hippo this morning that we got to see him this afternoon. That's really cool. I thought it was going to have to be a morning thing, but we will. We'll try and get him coming back towards the river in the morning. But how hilarious is that? I hope you all had a chuckle. I cackled quite a bit, as you can see, all the people are staring at me, and I'm like, what on earth is this girl going on about? But whatever. <laughs> Anyways, somebody else, and I'm not talking about Jamie here, but the animals that she's sitting with would probably give me a run for, for the money in terms of the way that they laugh. The animal I'm sitting with is gone into the den. But that's just how it all goes. Taylor, I don't think you're crazy. I completely understand. So the den site is still quiet. That cub came from far away, actually. Oh, hello. There we go. Yes, we're talking about you. Thank you. You may feel free to show up to the party. Hello. Come on. Come say hello. I've got no idea who it is, by the way. I need a bit more context as well to try and figure it out. I know that line of spots, and I think it is... Who is it? Zigzag up the shoulder. I end up going through the pictures in my head to try and remember, but some of them are so old that I, I can't quite line them up. Zigzag up and down. I think it might even be BFG. No, I don't think it's BFG. I don't know. I'll figure it out. I promise. I'll unpuzzle it when the cub comes closer. Either way, we've got one little fluff ball. No sign of Sour's little fluff ball, Sloth Bear. He hasn't popped his head out yet. So I was saying to you that yesterday we were with them last night. And they didn't get up to very much at all. They were all here. Fergus and Hershey, both of Waffles' sons, showed up. But there was absolutely no sign of Waffles, who, of course, leads a clan of well over 70 members. Now, Umkar, while we have a look at Sal, who is thoroughly fast asleep in her bush, you want to know what's the largest ever recorded clan of spotted hyenas. And you know I have absolutely no idea what the exact number is. I know that there have been clans recorded of over 100 members, and in fact, 
one not far from where we are now, which was initially the Talek clan, which then split into three. I can tell you that the North clan is larger than its neighboring clan, which is the Happy Zebra clan, which has around about 55 or so members, as opposed to the... Honestly, I think there might even be closer to 80 members of North clan with all of these cubs running about. I'd have to do a proper head count. And of course, I'd need all of them together. So I'm, I'm not sure. I'll double check and see if there's an actual recorded largest clan ever. I know that in Botswana, they can have massive, massive clans. And in the Mara, of course, they have very large clans. Whereas in South Africa, generally speaking, the hyena clans tend to be slightly smaller. I don't want to give too much of a blanket rule there because, of course, the Elephant Plains clan um, in the Sabi Sand is absolutely massive and probably over 40 members. So almost the size of the Happy Zebra clan. But honestly, I'd have to go and double check. You know, all of these termite mounds start looking the same, don't they? Did you see something there, Manu? Oh, oh, the there you go. <laughs> they do all start looking the same, don't they? You can't remember which one you saw the hyena behind. I know I've seen a fourth hyena. Riley's here, by the way. The male that we keep seeing around the den. But he's flat and hidden at the moment. And then there's somebody else. I, c I can't remember where I saw it. I saw a flat hyena somewhere on my way in here. And this is... Oh! Hey, Manu, well done. Very impressive. That, I think, is... Ri Who's that now? Is that Riley? Okay, that's Riley. I can't keep track of where I saw Riley. Now, this is probably not the most enthralling spotted hyena sighting ever, but this is essentially what we've been doing while we haven't been live. So you haven't been with us, but for hours and hours and Manu, how many hours? Many hours a day? Many hours a day. We've been sitting waiting for those special moments. But patience pays off, does it not? And speaking of patience, Steve has been very patient. Let's go and find out if he has had his reward. Yes, well, we found something that we've been helping Rexon to find for a little while. I didn't want to say too much when we were looking at those baboons because Rexon had found some tracks and so we've been giving him a hand and look at who we found on top of a termite mound surveying the landscape it is indeed the queen herself Tundi and she is only 50 meters from the boundary with Torchwood and um, Impala alerted Rex to her position and he was very grateful to ask us to come and join him and here she sits in the open as a right queen does on her throne she is listening I have no doubt that everybody who's watching is very excited it's always wonderful to see the leopardess Tandy but no sign of her youngster around uh, the tracks we've been following were of a female on her own and as Rex and, and Herbie often like to say the tracks were steaming <laughs> steaming fresh and indeed they were she was trying to sneak up on some impala that are just on the other side of that mound from where she was looking a moment ago. But the game is up. They spotted her. And she's doing a typical predator move. Once they've been spotted, they just pretend to be aloof as if they don't really care. Just, just turn their head the other way and kind of go off into that sort of very dismissive sort of posture even have a little bit of a sleep but the ears tell you more the ears are listening for their movements and then she's gonna shoot a cheeky little look to the left in a moment to see what they're doing giraffe girl no I, I think i just mentioned that that she we just tracked her um who knows how far back columba is but um from nyala it's south about a kilometer or so away is where the tracks were found and so she's probably left the lumber down there somewhere, but we didn't have tracks of her with her cub. So it's just her at the moment, and uh, she's probably gone off in search of a meal. The tracks were in the road and very, very fresh, so she's probably only been up for the last little while moving. And I think she is a little bit more successful without the lumber in tow. 
And no doubt if she does catch something, she'll be going and calling the naughty little youngster to come and join her, as a good mother does, not before having a good feed of herself. There you can see she's still interested in the impala that on the other side. And, you know, what can happen sometimes is that the impala can almost lose sight of her and then they can forget about her or they can move off and others can move in that weren't quite sure what was happening and if they just pretend to not care for the longest time well then eventually they can maybe catch up but um, these impala who are being very watchful would obviously not want to be fighting with Tundi in the area but Sydney's found a couple that are I have got a very interesting fight here again. Now is the impalas. Earlier on it was the giraffes. Look at that. Some of these impalas, they do break their horns. During this kind of fight, some of them I've seen, they've, they're left with one horn. You can hear those horns are very strong. You can hear the sound. So that they're trying to concentrate to what is happening. So these kind of fightings, we normally see them during the breeding season of the impalas. So the impalas, they prepare for breeding from January up to May. May, you will see these young males together with the uh, matured males chasing each other making even some funny noises such as uh, 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 that is rat you can see these horns can lock this is a real fight this is very much interesting you can see it's still going there they are going to fight again so you'll see, when the impalas are rutting, during the breeding season, they chase each other and fighting, raising up their tails. And when the tail is, is, is up, you'll see it has got some bright fluffy hairs. When, when it's showing off those white, white colors, you will hear them as punctuated with a sound such as, uh, 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 uh. that is when they're rutting. So the impalas, they've got this kind of horns for this kind of fights, but they are also equipped with a very good speed. And their bodies, they are much flexible to jump and run. If you look right at the back of their... Our beard, that is uh, a very nice command. They use these horns to fight themselves. But when it comes to the predators, it's very much rare. I have seen an impala female leading a very big head. And that head did not have a dominant male. And they were approaching a leopard. So that impala was not nervous. All the impalas were coming behind and she was leading. And she was leading and this leopard uh, had to withdraw the hunting activities. She was not nervous at all. So you can see those horns are very nice and sharp at the tip. Uh, Clayton, the possibilities are very much high. If you look at the uh, tip of every horn, is nice and sharp. Any mistake, it can be able to affect the eyes. And if you look at the eyes, the eyes on this impala, they are even way much bigger than the sock. It's quite a very big pupil. So it's very much easy. You can see now that they are locked. This is very serious. I don't know what they are fighting about now because they were supposed to fight by the beginning of May. Now is after their breeding season, so I don't know what is it that is influencing this kind of fighting activities. 
So now I am going to carry on. I can see the fight is over now. I will carry on towards the western side of the game reserve and see if we can find any of the cats. I will be focusing on Tingana at the moment. When I'm looking at the at sun, I can see it's about to go down and this clouds temperature is cooling. Let's see, Tandy is already active to show that cats are going to be active now. Let's see if we can find Tingana. Yes, well, she put her head up. What I was suggesting before is that she waits for those impala to lose, or to, to lose interest, or to forget that she's there. And then she's going to peel off. Clever girl is going to use a vehicle to hide herself. She's going to sneak around the back and uh, come at the impala from an angle they weren't expecting. Because she's basically just melting into the long grass now. If they lose sight of her, they'll get quite panicked and uh, they might even run in her direction. It's very possible. Constantly scanning with her ears. She's made a, a decision on where she's going to go. She's probably going to try and come around them. I can't see them anymore. moved off. So the leopard that you can't see, you see how she's having a scan? The leopard you can't see is a dangerous leopard. The one you can see, well, that one's not too much of a problem. When they sneak around like this, when it becomes very difficult, and that is the element of surprise that these cats enjoy. Okay, well, we're going to get around here a more open position giving her lots and lots of space but while we do that let's go all the way back up to the Masai Mara with Taylor and I know she loves her elephants. Well done Steve Bobo for finding Tandy. Anyways while you're having some great times with Tandy we magicked up some elephants there we go just as promised but again you've got the not quite the tail in because I don't think they're gonna go anywhere but you do have their tails and uh, isn't that sweet that mom and calf have programmed their tails to swat at the same time? <laughs> I'm talking absolute nonsense. The sun has really got to me today. I'm exceptionally sunburnt, even though I put on about 30 litres of sunscreen. Maybe I should have opted uh, for the, the version of sunscreen that elephants use by covering themselves in mud. Maybe that would have been a better option. So I'll give that a bash and let you all know. I don't know... Um, I don't know how the bosses would feel about me just doing an entire show covered in mud, but if it's going to keep me keep me out of the sun or keep me from getting sunburnt, I might just have to. And uh, I feel like my eyes are even sunburned today. Can your eyes get sunburnt? Maybe. But um, who wants to see my shirt tan? Because I've really been working on it. Hey, Archie. Have to do this. Hang on. Because I'm getting tangled now. How great is that? Aren't you all... So envious of that amazing tan. It doesn't look as good as it looks better in person. Hey, Archie, does it look better in person? Looks so much better in person. It's so great. I'll never be able to wear a dress ever again in my uh, entire life. No, Megan, it's actually not too much safari parkour. Megan is directing. I, I've been on one safari, two safari parkour since I've been here. We have been busy. We're working here in the Mara. Um, so, yeah, it's been lots of fun. Obviously, we get to spend lots and lots of time with the elephants. I'm just thinking, stand by. Un momento, let me go down again. I'm going to reverse. Do you know why, Archie? Because the sighting on the other side of the road is so much cooler. Because um, what I'll do is I'll do a little, a little reversey poo. So you'll have to just uh, bear with me. It sh shouldn't take too long. We're not really going. There's the lovely scenery. Yeah. Oh. I didn't quite get the entire question. I think the gist of it was, do the elephants seem bigger in the Mara? Nah. See, how pretty is this scene? Hi, girl. Um, oh, the elephant's tusks. There we go. Thanks, Meg. Sorry, it lost comms there for a second. Um, they, they, they do tend to get bigger. Definitely out of the cows, I've noticed um, that typically their tusks are a lot larger than that in South Africa. 
And then, I mean, there's some great tuskers. Archie and I have been very lucky. We've seen some incredible bulls um, bearing some beautiful ivory. So they, they get big tusks. But in South Africa, you know, you can also get elephants with massive tusks. But, you know, poaching is a real thing. And um, it, it happens everywhere here in Kenya too, also, of course, in South Africa. But it seems as though a lot of the big tusks, tuskers in South Africa have unfortunately been poached out. And, of course, tusk size has all got to do with genetics. And if they're... No massive bulls around to pass on those, you know, that that um, genetic that brings about the massive ivory. Then you are going to get elephants with smaller, smaller tusks. Oh, Archie, I don't know if you can get it. I might be asking too much. I've just seen a little hair in another one. Maybe it's going to. It looks like a green backed hair, and it's actually just come out on the road. So now this is really it gets tricky because Archie now cannot really see what's going on. Hello, what you doing? I like your hair. I like the way that it's fluffing itself up like that. Look how cool that is. Run, run, run. Quickly, get across the road. You'll feel much safer in the long grass. <laughs> Man, I love animals. They are so cool. They always do the craziest things for me. Even something like that puts a smile on my face. But yes, we're back to our beautiful scene, and now we're going to get some nice dappled light on these elephants too which will be perfect. There's also a lot of bugs around. I'm sure you can see them um, just every now and then when the light catches them, and little midges of sorts. I hope they don't come into the car because I don't want to be bitten by them. Uh, I don't want to, don't think Archie wants to be bitten by them either. Hang on, now I've just seen something. I just, before I point it out, I want to have a closer look. Ah, oh, no. I thought I'd seen a sunbird's nest, but it's not. It's just um, a weaver's nest of sorts, but it's kind of falling to pieces. There's another youngster, sub-adult elephant. And they're loving all this lovely tall grass. So we're basically, just to give you a bit of reference, we're at that little bridge where the Hummercorps built their nest. The, the, so that's this area that we're in at the moment. It might look familiar to all of you. We, we don't have a good angle to look at the nest. So you, you could, I'm not going to talk about it too much just because it's very difficult for Archie to film. But there we go. In that pattern wood tree is the Hummercorp nest. And it's now completely closed. I have yet to see Mr. and Mrs. Hummercorp. I don't know where they are. Very sweet. Well, we're going to move on from these elephants because it's about time we start uh, making our way towards the escarpment road. But in the meantime, off you go to Steve, who's got some impala that are creeping closer to Tundi. Yes, well, Tundi did a big loop. Um, she's gone downwind of these impala, who obviously moved slightly off from where they were before and weren't looking at her anymore. That's what encouraged her to to make that move that we saw. And um, she's done a loop. She's coming around from the right-hand side and over their shoulder, so to speak. We can't see her now, but she made a very deliberate movement around this sort of thicket and started moving towards them. Um, Rexon has moved out, so it's just us here. But if they spot her, they will make a lot of noise. There's only a small group of Impala. It's not a very large group, and that gives her a little bit more of an edge. Um, and she's going around because that is where the wind is blowing. So she'll be able to smell them. And the wind is, is not very strong, but it's enough to mask her silent movements and also to mask her smell. That is one of the biggest things that the Impala will pick up on is her scent. And so she's probably going to try to sneak up behind them. We're just going to stay right here. And as the Impala relax even more, you see how relaxed they are. They've completely forgotten there's a leopard in the area. Maybe they weren't sure. Maybe they thought they saw one and then never really confirmed it. Maybe they smelt one, and that's why she was hiding behind that termite mound. But they're not very alert. Some of them are feeding. and they are slowly moving in a direction that might be favorable towards her. You can just hold it there, Seb, and I'm just going to scan with my binoculars and see if I can see her anywhere slinking up. There's no way she'd pass this meal up. She would have a go. So there's a good chance that um, if we just stick with these Impala, she will reveal herself again off and then we can follow her but let's give her the best chance we possibly can and also let the impala do what they're supposed to do 
We, we can't see the leopard. We're not in the way. This is the time of patience. So this could take a long time. This could be very quick. I think James was thinking the same thing yesterday when he saw that impala on the island with the, the crocodile. That could honestly have gone on for days. But um, it didn't. It happened very fast. But remember, folks, this is live. Anything could happen. Another leopard could materialize out of nowhere. A cheetah could just run out from the side of the bushes. Lions could fly in. Well, probably not fly in, but you know what I mean. Or even hyena could move in from anywhere and just blow all of the hunt because, you know, they like to follow leopards around. And there's one individual I know up in the Masai Mara who knows a hell of a lot about hyena. They can, actually. Um, they can move to far more places than we can follow in our vehicle, and that's something that we've experienced quite regularly recently. So that hyena that has been so obliging right up until now with its bottom facing us is Paisley, my favorite hyena cub. So Paisley's mother is Billie Jean, and the Billie Jean's pattern is, or Billie Jean's theme, is patterns. So all of the cubs that she has are named after patterns. Um, at one point, Paisley had a brother called Plaid, or Plaid, depending upon how you pronounce it. Uh, he is dead, unfortunately. He did not make it. And an older sibling called Camo, although unfortunately I don't think Camo is still with us either. So Paisley is her mom's sole representative for now. And she even, poor little thing, she came up to us and <laughs> said hello. And I completely ignored her because I didn't even notice because we were busy trying to sort out a vehicle issue. Sorry, Pays. She decided we were boring and off she went. Much more entertaining to be over there. So I think that we, we do actually have most of the cubs here. We just can't see them at the moment. I'm sure they're all hiding off in the distance, sleeping somewhere. Their old den is not far away from here. Honey, do you think you can pick out the termite mount of the old den? <laughs> See, I'll be, I'll be even more impressed if there's a hyena still around it. I think it was a bit further to the left. I can see the, the acacia tree that we always drove down to. Now I can't. S yeah, there we go. It's there somewhere. That's a topi, not a hyena. <laughs> there, I think that's it. We'll go with that because no one knows any different. So well done, Manu. Manu, <laughs> Manu found the old den site. We're not far away at all. Manu and I were actually joking not so long ago. And we wish that we could put totally um, unrestrictive trackers on the hyenas. And that basically we'd, we, we would have a constant update on the position of every single member of the clan. And you could map their movements, who they hang out with, who they don't. It would be really interesting. Maybe different colors for females, males, low rankers, higher... I don't know. One day, one day, when technology advances sufficiently. It would just be so interesting to know exactly who's where at all times. Or maybe I'm just nosy. But I have become rather attached to them. And Paula, you're saying you're impressed that I can recognize the individuals. Not all of them. Definitely not all of them. In fact, probably not even the majority of North Clan. I know all the mothers at the den. And I know most of the cubs by sight. And I'm trying desperately to learn the rest of the clan. And the way that I do that is I get their photos up on my computer. And I scramble them in a random order. And then I put a piece of paper over the top of the name. And then I go through it and I guess in my own mind, I test myself who it is. But the problem with that is that I've started to remember the, the poses that the hyenas are in in the photos. And which one it is based on that rather than remembering the spots. So I've worked hard at it. But the best way is for me to actually sit and go through the footage afterwards and go, okay, that one's that one, that one's that one, that one's that one and so on. It was very kind of Michigan State University to share that information with us. And I heard through the grapevine, because we actually found the den site here, not this one, but the one across the lugger, I heard through the grapevine that they might just be naming it the Safari Live Den. Yay! How cool is that? 
because they they name each every and every den site so that people who come in after them obviously have an idea of where the different den sites are because as you know hyenas reuse them and this particular one was totally unexpected and i happened to find sour moving sloth bear there back at night lots of cubs around went back the next morning or the next afternoon and found the entrance to the den and so now it looks like it might be forever called the Safari Live Den. How cool is that? Uh, we've got another, another cub incoming. <laughs> Excuse me, James. You know this. I've been trying to work that one out because James's question is whether or not hyenas in the Mara move less frequently than the ones in South Africa. And I suspect, I couldn't say the word suspect there, I suspect that they move less frequently in the Mara than they do in South Africa. Just from what we've observed from not just this particular clan, but from the, the clan outside Governor's Camp, from the clan around Talek, from the clan Happy Zebra, South Clan. However, after all of the rains, I think that that did change things a little bit. And they seem to, now they've moved twice in the space of about three weeks. I don't know if this really counts as a move, though, because we can still see the other den. But either way, I think they, on average, move less frequently than the ones in South Africa. Be an interesting study to conduct, I think. I think it would be an interesting study. It would be an interesting study to read. Let's put it that way. I'm not sure how interesting it would be to conduct means and averages and all sorts of things that goes into research. Oh, there's some ground hornbills that Paisley was looking at briefly. They're over there. <coughs> Here we go. Here we go. Well done, Manu. I see them pretty much every day on my way to the den as well. There's a pair around here. How nice is that? And a marabou stalk, marabou stalk. Looks like a marabou stalk at the back. Not that one, but yes, that one That one will do too. That is a yellow bull stalk. Huh. We've got all the birds here. Now I've lost the... I've lost them again. Manu, I don't know what these hyenas did after we left. Manu and I had to depart the den earlier than expected. I think it must have been around about nine last night due to a technical glitch. So we didn't stay the whole night with them. I don't know what these hyenas got up to after we left, but I feel like they waited till we left to throw a massive party because everyone is very sleepy today. And I haven't seen waffles in days. I'm starting to take it personally. Oh, we've got one coming in. Well spotted. That Berg again. Oh wait, let me let me see him side on and wait before I throw guesses out there. Okay. We're going to wait for this one to turn sideways so I can figure out who it is for all of you and preferably it's non muddy side. Let's go across to an animal that North Clan loves to hunt. It is Ferg. <laughs> These are the buffalo that live on the hill. Lone Hill Buffalo, could we call them? Very cool, though. It's such a beautiful shot. Now, they're relatively close to us. Well, that's why Archie is able to put the camera almost directly in their face. Well, he's not really putting the camera in his face. He's just hitting the zoom button. But there's a, a group of them. Most of them males, and I'm not sure if that one that we were looking at was a male or a female, because this morning I have to tell you a very funny story because you know that's what I'm all about we came across a scene where we had oh you're old that's definitely an old buffalo you can see he's worn he probably was in was watching what was going on anyways on the steepest part of the escarpment road there was a one buffalo trying to mount another buffalo but they were both males um, but the one had such small horns, it looked like he was a female it was bizarre, it was quite interesting and I think it might have been that one although I don't know, Archie, that one that we saw had very deformed horns, eh? This one, anyways, I don't know if it is the same one. It might be a cow. It doesn't have a big boss. And that's exactly what I said earlier this morning to Archie, but then, in fact, it was a boy, so I don't know. Going back to sleep again, though. 
No, they live up here. They they don't really venture too far down. They're quite happy to live up on the slopes, except when the Olololo pride of lions come around. Although, to be honest, I've seen the Olololos being chased by more buffalo than them actually eating buffalo. So I haven't quite worked worked it out just yet. <laughs> Like and yes, buffalo do always look like they have an annoyed um, sort of glare to them. It looks like they always owe you, well, you owe them money, as we always say. And I suppose Jamie was showing you the accountant, the ground hornbill from a distance. But I quite like all the white that this buffalo has. I think it also must have been rolling in some mud or something like that. Archie, does it look like it's lost quite a bit of hair to you on its body? Or is that just dirt? You can see they don't... Say again? It's aging, says um, <laughs> says Archie. Yeah, it does look like a bit a bit of hair loss there. Oh, we better get you some jacket plum seed oil to rub all over your body. That helps encourage hair growth. Very very cool. How awesome is this? Then I have to show you something else. I'm going to stand up now and hope that the car doesn't roll away. This is why I was reluctant to stand up. Check these zebra out. Guess where they're going. <sighs> They're going up the escarpment road and then they're going to go into camp and they're going to chew really loudly outside our tents. The other night uh, there must have been a herd of about, I don't know, 20 of them running around camp. Something caused them to, well something must have startled them and they ran. One ran into a guy rope, so the ropes that hold the tents down. The, uh, and then I just saw my whole tent move and I couldn't work out what it had gone on. Obviously jumped up with a fright. and. Uh, it was the zebra that were tripping over all the ropes. And VM, I think, was saying he also had, he thought he saw the figure of a zebra almost inside his tent because one of his tent so hard. So they're really funny. They obviously feel quite safe in and around camp, but they, they do cause a bit of havoc. Every now and then when you're stumbling to the bathroom at 2 o'clock in the morning or whatever it may be, it is so funny because they'll all be sitting down and you come around the, the corner. There are quite a few big shrubs in camp, so we have to walk around in camp with, with uh, torches because of hippos and leopards and lions and all sorts of things. And then the zebra will get up and run one way and then you also just about fall over backwards the other way anyways Archie and I are going to say good night to all of you um, we're very dirty we probably need to hop into the shower get nice and clean um, but we will see you bright and early tomorrow morning we'll send you back to South Africa and one day Sydney I look forward to meeting you goodbye Taylor I am now at one of the very stunning sightings. This is quite a very beautiful sunset. Sunset, I always tell people, to me, it never gets old. Look at that. It seems like it's the first time today for me to see the sunset. This is lovely. Africa is beautiful. The positioning of the Juma Game Reserve is a very nice spot in order to watch the sunset. Look at that. The reflection of the sun, that very nice reddish color looks phenomenal. The marula trees with the sun behind looks very nice. When the sun is showing like this, it's a sign to me that very shortly there will be some nocturnal activities. The nocturnal activities, they are starting to feel it now that the sun is going down. We must have to come out now. I'm hoping to see some of the interesting birds before I finish this evening. I will be concentrating on some of the owls. Still cats, I am after them. So I will be hitting at least two birds with one stone. I'll be looking for both cats and beds. This is a beautiful. Look at that. I am really enjoying the sunset with just my naked eyes. No glass is nothing. I'm just seeing that size of a ball. This is beautiful. It is not every day whereby I can watch the sunset like this. But the condition today allows me to do so. The weather condition is not bad. It's very much peace and quiet where I am. 
I am right in the wilderness. The only thing I'm hearing is the bed calls and the little bit of wind blowing. Africa is beautiful. I can hear some other birds trying to advertise themselves. Uh, Toothy, at this stage it is getting chilly a little bit. I can see there's even some clouds formation as I'm talking to you now. Not too sure if maybe we might uh, get some little bit of showers in the morning. But yes, something is happening. The weather is changing. It's getting cold. I'm seeing some of the dark clouds also forming. Where the sun is now, I am not seeing any of the clouds, but now I am asking Senza to show you that there is some clouds formation. You can see now the clouds are showing. So there is something building, not to show if it will be raining tomorrow morning or maybe in the middle of the night today. The rain by this time of the year, it does come because it must come and then wet the leaves from the grasses and from the trees so that the decomposition process can start. Even if it's not too much, but it's going to make a difference because these leaves and everything suddenly becomes food for the soil and the rain must have to shower that so that the organisms that eat these things can activate and start eating. Look at that. The marula tree looks dead, but it's not dead. All we are seeing is just dry branches with the sun going down. Coming back here during the summer season, everything is just going to be different. And also to see the sun like this, when it's going to be... Steve is driving around on the other side, not too sure what he's looking for at the moment. Let's see what he's going to tell us. Let's see his next agenda. Thanks, Sid. Well, we had Tundi. The Impala on their own got that sort of sixth sense, you know, when something's stalking up to you. And uh, they decided to run away from where she potentially was and you know that feeling you get and then as they started moving she started coming towards them and she came out we saw her slink towards the road we try to follow her across here fell in a hole got out <laughs> but we have no leopard to report I'm terribly sorry we drove in there have a look at it I mean Seb just showed it to you but anyway could be my guess well we're gonna Drive around, we're not far from Cheetah Cut Line. See if she maybe followed those Impala towards that sort of area and see if she maybe came out. She wasn't far from them. There's a Franklin shouting down there. I'm gonna go back that way. Franklin often shouts at leopards when they move. Let's go back where we came. A little bit of a reversing maneuver. Hold on, Seb. I'll find a spot to turn around in a second. Here we go, that's a good one. It's a very big block, lots of long grass. Perfect area for a leopardess to be doing her hunting. An area animals are never really safe. And Tundi spent a lot of time up here, she knows the area quite well. We just need to keep our eyes and ears open. Angel, I, I don't know. I think they do. I think they purr. Not like our house cats purr. But they do, um... They, I don't know. Seb, do leopards purr? I don't, I heard that it's cheetahs. Cheetah definitely purr. Yeah, I don't think lions and leopard I don't purr. think lion, you're right. I don't think lion and leopard actually do that purring sound. They look like they should though. They look very cute. <laughs> the young ones do anyway. So I'm just going into silent mode with the vehicle. We're coming down um, Drakensberg now. It's possible that she might have cut across. We just heard a Franklin shouting over there. 
So having the vehicle off will help us to listen. So everything that sees her will shout. Although Tristan had Hosanna, I think yesterday, or was it this morning, I can't remember, nothing was shouting at him. So we do see that. Sometimes the animals realize, well, if I shout, I'm just going to be opening myself up to attack. You only really shout if you believe that your alarm call is going to distress others and they're going to run. And through the... There's more shouting over there. Through that stressed period, it attracts... Everyone goes crazy. And the predator goes for the animal that's moved. But if you're the only one shouting, well... Ah... Uh, that was a bird of prey. That's why they're an African hawk eagle. It's just flying off there. That is why the birds are shouting. They like to hunt in pairs, and they do have quite a taste for guinea fowl and Franklin, and they know it. Oh well, we're going to keep circling this block. We'll get back onto Cheetah Cutla and see if that initial thought runs true. Otherwise, we might just be lucky and bump into it in the road. So who knows what could happen. Driving in here, Seb and I have fallen in holes before. And we're not just going to go careening in there, but Jamie is still with her predators all the way up in the Masai Mara. Let's go and see what interesting tales she has for you. Our hyena are slowly starting to wake up, and that looks like... I don't know who that is. But it was Ferg, by the way, who came through earlier. Fergus, the son of the matriarch, who is now fast asleep off in the bushes. Oh, come say hello. Should get a little bit of an idea of dominance here. <laughs> Still sleepy. Still very sleepy. They're not full, though, and the fact that Ferg is the highest ranking one makes me think that they didn't actually get very much. Now, Ilana, I'm not sure what the exact statistical survival rate is for cubs, specifically in the Mara. I can tell you that the most dangerous time for them is not so much now when they're at the communal den, but when they are, when they are moving around and graduating, so moving away from the den for the first time, because, of course, they don't have the same experience that the adults do, and they have to learn to get around without having a bolt hole to disappear into. And I would say that probably the survival rate is higher than that of a leopard or a lion or a cheetah, but probably not by much. And in fact, I don't think it would be that much higher than a lion out here. I'll ask the researchers. I'll tell you what, what I'll do is I'll ask the researchers and see if they can give me a, an exact statistic or an average statistic rather than an exact one. Typically speaking, there's not much difference. In fact, I don't think there is much of a correlation at all between a high-ranking cub versus a low-ranking cub's survival rate. Does that make sense? So you'd sort of expect a high-ranking cub to be more likely to survive than a low-ranking cub because, you know, it's top of the pile. But that's not actually the case because they still face the same threats. Lions, of course, being the biggest one, perhaps a rival hyena clan, but essentially lions being the main one. A lion will kill a hyena if it can catch it. Oh, we're going to whoop. Come on, please whoop. It's the cutest thing. Oh, no, we're going to go back to sleep. When Tip was injured and hiding in this den site, every time someone came running past, she'd go, Ooh, ooh, ooh. In a little baby voice, which was adorable. Oh, sorry, Sal. Did I wake you up? Brief moment of lifting her heads. Her head. I'll tell you what. I will actually ask the researchers very shortly because they're about to arrive. Jill, there is actually a particular reason as to why hyenas are so hunched over. And that's all to do with the energy efficiency in the way that they're structured. So with those high shoulders, very powerful shoulders, which of course also all connect into the powerful bite, the powerful jaw, because that's, you know, you know all muscles are essentially connected and you've got levers. 
So although that sagittal crest serves as an attachment point, you've also got muscles extending down into the shoulders. So they've got these very powerful shoulders and a powerful crunching bite. Then they've got these sloping backs and almost weak looking hindquarters. And when you watch little cubs when they're new, you can actually see them stumble about. You can see how much weaker their hindquarters are. But when they move, they move in an incredibly energy efficient way. And that's why they've got, they're, they're marathon runners, basically. They'll run and run and run. So their shoulders take most of the work and their back legs kind of swing behind them. And when they walk, they do a, a crosswalk. And it's, you know, when you get your, when you sort of walk casually and you could pretty much walk casually all day if, you, if you're in that sort of condition, you can walk casually almost all day. And that's the sort of stride that they get into. It's a certain speed and a sway and a motion that is very energy efficient for them. So that's why when the hyenas get up, they don't stop. So they take Manu and myself on a wild ride and they don't walk, they run. Whereas a lion or a leopard or a cheetah will walk for a while, lie down, carry on. Hyenas get up and they go. And then they go, oh, something smells exciting. I like that smell. You like that smell. We both like that smell. Look, I have something in common with you. Please don't bite my bum. Kind of social sniff. And then they carry on running. Fascinating to watch. I don't know if I described that very well. I could picture it in my head. Essentially what they'll do is one high ranker will go and sniff something. And then the others will come and sniff against it as well as if to say, look, I like this too. We have something in common. You like me. I don't know where Waffles is. I saw both of her sons last night. I'm just surprised she didn't show up to the party. Now, there's lots of creatures that, that start to wake up as it, it gets dark. Sydney is on the search for some of them, but in this case, they have wings. I am now again heading back towards the dam and try to see if maybe I can find Tingana because that is what I am looking for at the moment. I will be looking for Tingana and some of the owls if I can be lucky this evening. But since I've started, Tingana tracks, they are just nowhere to be found. Last time Tingana was seen, it was this morning somewhere down here. So I'm just going to do my final round of check and see if I'm going to be lucky there. No tracks, nothing. So it means this animal is avoiding Rosalind, I didn't copy that question very well. Rosalind, in Africa, it is going to be summer anytime soon. From the 1st of September is the beginning of spring. Shortly after that, we are entering summer. So it will be raining anytime soon from end of October, November. So that is the beginning of our summer. So the dry season and the summer season, they are not the same, also in terms of the animals' activities. So during the summer season, animals don't travel long distances because what is more important in the bush here is better grazing as well as a lot of food availability. Once there is better grazing, it means the animals that get hunted, they've got to be very much stationary feeding and drinking water nearby, which then attracts the predators. Predators as well, they don't travel long distances during that time. So let's see, Steve already started driving on infrared. Let's see how he's doing. Woo! <laughs> Persistence. Persistence pays off, ladies and gentlemen. We did a big loop around the block. And I was losing a bit of hope there until Meg says we're asking for a link. 
and we asked for a link and look at what we found in the road well isn't that gorgeous I'm going to assume from where she is that it is also that it's still Tundi from before let's give her some space because I don't know what she's spotted over there that's a persistence and gut feeling I mean initially we were turning around to come on to Cheetah Katla, that's where we are now. And then that Franklin alarm call made us go the other way. And then that was obviously the the African Harrier African hawk eagle that was causing them to, to shout. But she is in the road. Uh, we're not far south from the central and Cheetah Katla sort of junction. Hello Rosalind, Tundi's in her 13th year, so it's quite an old, quite a, a, a quite a big age for, for a leopard to be honest, 13, 14, 15 I think is like, is one of the oldest, I don't know what the oldest recorded leopard in the wild is, but 13 is definitely getting on man, I know Tingana's in his 12th year, so for a male that's a phenomenal age. Obviously, lots more competition and fighting between the males. So for him to still be hanging on is an amazing feat. But the wind is coming from her right-hand side. She's listening very delicately to the wind. If you can listen delicately, that is. She can hear some rutting in parlor in the distance, and I wonder if it's going to catch her intention. Because there is this whole belief that there's this sort of second rut that happens in sort of August, September for a few of the females that's sort of missed being impregnated during the rutting season earlier this year. And their pheromones obviously boister the guys up again and you get the sort of second rut in the year. I don't know too much about it. It's, there's a lot of talk. I don't know if there's been too much research on it. It's definitely something in the air that's exciting the males. I'm just going to move up a few meters just so we can get another look at her and then we'll switch off again give her the silence that she requires bone crusher queen yes it's a good age but I don't know if she is looking to have more cubs I mean it's possible she might want to mate again what has she spotted? I can't see anything over there. There's a bit of a termite mound on the right of the road. Oh wow, there's a whole herd of impala in the open there on that burnt patch that are completely invisible to the naked eye. If you just pan straight in there, Seb, a little bit more right. We are in, in the infrared. There you can see them moving around. They're in the open. Uh, for her to stalk across that burnt area would be impossible. I think it would be beyond her limits to be able to stalk across this. So she's trying to figure out, are they maybe going to come a little bit closer? Because um, the small group that she was following on behind before was um, a lot easier. But when they're in a number of that, there's more than 25, 30 of them there. I didn't spend too much time looking. But um, very hard to sneak up on them. But we're on the fire break of, Buffalo, of uh, Torchwood. Those are beautiful spots. So to the right of us is the is the fire break. And then on the other side of the fire break, with that termite mine, if you go just a little bit more to the right there, Seb, she's maybe looking for the cover of the opposite side of the termite mine. Just a bit more over. A bit more over, a bit more right, sorry. There, the other side of the fire break. There's where the grass gets long again. She's looked there a few times. She's wondering if she can sneak in there. But the wind is not in her favor from there. So she's really going to think about this. But we're going to stay with her. And it seems like Sydney's luck has paid off. He's found something with spots himself. I managed to find Tala. I managed to find Tingana this afternoon after a very long hunt. At least it has been successful at the end. Here comes Tingana. Look at that. Beautiful. I am so very much happy at the moment because I nearly gave up. Look at the stomach. Nice and full. You can see that Tingana is not hungry at all. This is beautiful.
You can see the tail there is telling me that he is interested on something, not too sure what it is. But looking at the at the stomach now, I can promise you, even if something come here, it's not going to manage to chase because it's now going to have some water as well. You can see now the tail is telling us the mood. These cats are beautiful. Look at that. Look at that. You can see the stomach is full and again it's coming here to fill up. This is beautiful. But it's very much inquisitive. I'm not too sure what is it maybe he saw earlier before I have arrived. When it's drinking like that from a distance, it's very much difficult to even see that this is a cat drinking. From a distance, it seems like nothing is here at the dam. King Port, let's hope for the best. Tingana is lovely hearing him sewing. I do enjoy that. He can do that. He can sew very much nicely and it's fascinating. I like to imitate him too much. It means he's been hiding somewhere here in these bushes because I've been here earlier and I saw nothing, no tracks, nothing. But I told myself I must have to come here for the second final check because I was very much suspicious while I was here earlier on. I have looked everywhere. I didn't see any sign. And I nearly passed him. He was so very much camouflaged. He was not on the road. He is very much thirsty. See, I have never seen uh, Tingana swimming, but I know the lepers, they can be able to swim very much nicely. But Senzo once saw uh, Tingana swimming. He just told me now that, yes, he once saw Tingana swimming in one of these areas before. And this is beautiful. Tingana was very much thirsty because he has been drinking for the past few minutes now. Maybe that tongue doesn't collect quite a lot of water. Look at that. Yeah, I think he's getting a little bit of water every time he's trying to scoop from the tongue. So this, this animal is beautiful. This is my favorite, favorite leopard in the game reserve. Tingana and Hosanna, they are two favorite. Look at those eyes. They're drinking, but the eye contact is not focusing by the water. You can see the tongue is concentrating drinking, but the eyes are focusing outside. You can see where those eyes are situated is suitable for hunting purposes. That is a binocular vision. So they can be able to see and judge a distance very well when the head is lowered close to the ground. It is Galagopan. So now you can see he is done drinking, now heading towards 
at that side. So I'm gonna have to now rearrange and try to see if we can see where he's heading to. So I'm just gonna wait a little bit and see until he decides. I don't want to interfere or disturb his uh, plan. You can see that he's trying to listen to what is happening ahead of him. While I'm still checking what uh, Tingana is thinking, let's see, Steve is still trying to reallocate Tandy on the other side of the game reserve. Yes, well, she did exactly what I thought she might do, and that was to, to go across that fire break, that burnt area. As soon as Impala stopped looking at her, she jimmied across, and she went into the long grass, um, I had to find out other vehicles were on Torchwood because there were two vehicles there. And one has left, so we're able to cross over now. So we're just on the boundary of Torchwood, but we don't have sight of her at the moment. But uh, she made the exact same sort of impression she was going to for the last Impala. She's looping around. They're still up here somewhere. And I think she's listening for them. She's definitely on the hunt, definitely interested. Who knows what could happen here? But as I said, we just lost sight of it because we needed to communicate about getting onto the property. And she's somewhere in the long grass. Very, very camouflaged indeed. Well, our sun set a while ago, but up in the Masai Mara with Jamie Patterson, things work a little bit differently. Well, a hyena curled up underneath the sunset, and it really is the most extraordinary sky, accompanied to the peaceful signs of a hyena cub vomiting. But let's ignore the vomiting. Oh, sorry, Manu, I'm throwing you all over the show. I'm sorry, I'm so rusty. <laughs> Manu's going, which way are you going with this? You crazy woman. <laughs> sorry, Manu. <laughs> Here we go. Should we look at the sunset? Tell you what, you, Manu, you know what? You just show me what you want to show them, and I'll, I'll go with it. How's about that? Pretty, pretty sky, clouds that look like smoke, colors that look like they were painted, and a tree that looks like it was placed there. When are going? Which tree? Which tree? Okay, so now we're going to go back to little Pukey over here, who. Appears to have things under control. Yes, we've spent nothing more exciting than a communal. I am still following Tingana right here. Tingana is not very far away from me. You will see Tingana very nicely within the next few minutes. I can see that now he is going right through this area in order to get to the road there on the other side. Let me just try and go back to the road and see. We're going to meet him just now. In a very short space, we're going to meet Tingana on the road. It's just that Tingana decided to go this direction as if he is going away from the road and now I can see he is again coming back to the road. So Senzo, check him there. Can you see? Can you see him? He's not very far. He's, he's now on the road, I think, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, you see. I have got Tingana again now. You can see he's just standing there thinking about something. Not too sure, maybe something else made some little bit of noise which gained his concentration. This is beautiful. How he's standing is telling me that he did pick up something. Uh, 
Lisa, it is indeed very nice that both Tingana and Tandi has been spotted this afternoon. There's something that is gaining his concentration somewhere here nearby. I can see how he's standing. He's not moving. It's like he got surprised by something soon as he got to this place. They can hear very well. They can see very well. They can also smell very well. Maybe from one of these, he managed to pick up something. <laughs> Ivy, that is very true. He might be thinking about where Hosanna is because now he is depending on Hosanna. He, is, he has been taking quite a lot of food from Hosanna these days. That which is not that bad. Maybe he also worked hard before for Hosanna, for Hosanna to grow. So I can see now that he is right here on the other side of my vehicle, so I'm just going to try and follow him so that Senzo can be able to give you a better visual. This is beautiful, Senzo. So you can see now he is heading back to uh, that area where Hosanna is spending much of his time these days. So he might be going there hoping to eat something, but not today and tomorrow. I can see that his stomach is so very much full. Maybe he will eat a few days later. I haven't seen Tingana's kill for quite a long time. The last time I saw a kill from Tingana, it was just evidence while he caught his scrub hair some time ago. So now let's see, Steve already started looking for these animals from his spotlights. Let's see what Steve is going to find. Yes, well, we've lost her, folks, twice in a row. Those in parlor have put themselves in a very nice island of burnt grass. So I think it's an impossibility for her to sneak up on them. Uh, but maybe she was still lying there in wait, but we didn't want to shine on her to give away her position. We did have a couple little looks with the infrared camera, but Fortunately, we weren't able to find her again, but that is the way it works. Let's leave her to a nightly hunting so that she can provide for not only herself, but no doubt the Duke of Juma, who will soon be pressing on her for another meal, as is his want. But who knows? We are heading back now. The, uh, the Duke might move, be moving in this direction with Sydney, or we might bump into the little Chief Osana. I think we still, we're not close enough to Vuya Teller watching hall at the moment to Bamposana. That is his home. It's where he likes to hang out these days. It seems. What's it been? Two weeks? Already two weeks. It'll be, it'll be three weeks on Sunday, I think. <laughs> three weeks on Sunday. Fantastic. I think he's trying to break the, the record of 80 odd days. A Karula was seen. Shongile and Hosanna, 80 odd days in a row, unbroken. Okay, well, talking about Juma and about leopards that are famous, they are none more famous than Tingana. Tingana is slowly now moving towards the Galago Pen. He is not in a hurry, he's just moving very much slow, so it means that is where he's going to maybe spend much of his time tonight. Look at that left ear steering, trying to pick up some of the information from that side.
So this is very, very, very much phenomenal. He's trying to scratch how he decided to just lie on the ground. And it seems like now he has fully recovered. He's not limping at all. He's walking very nicely and he can be able to climb trees very high in order to get some food from uh, Hosanna, which is a good thing. He's very tired now, the bellies are full. So you can see that he's looking very much tired. The bellies are full, too much water and too much food. Yeah, the stomach looks very much big. I am so very much happy too to see this. It has been a very great afternoon today with both Tandi and Tingana, with some other small animals that we have shown you today. I really enjoyed the activity today because it was difficult for me to see Tingana, but suddenly I managed to find him. Thank you very, very much for all your questions and comments. Let's meet tomorrow at half past six.